Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 5th meeting of the Town of Richmond Select Board. Um, I will begin the meeting by asking if anybody present has comments on an item not on the agenda. Mary. Hey, did you miss me? We did. Yeah, yes. Thank you. I'm just saying that. Uh, Mary Hull, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to say some things about um, the projected item on the ballot and don't treat it like it's a personal attack. Don't treat it like it's an ugly stepchild uh, and don't treat it like it's your children. Um, because uh, there's three things that I hold near and dear to me. My food, my family, and my money. So I do not believe that this vote on the uh, town center is going to be the right choice. Uh, my first question, I'll be brief. Where do all the services go during the rehab? We have seven um, urgent services, which we the town clerk, the finance office, the town manager, the police department, planning, zoning, and of course the vault, which serves more than just those areas. We also have the post office, the art space, the historical center, the senior center, the OCC, the TV station. So I don't know where those people are supposed to be. And I can guarantee you that OSHA, VOSHA, and all the other OSHAs will not allow them to be in this building during any reconstruction because of the obvious um, infiltrate, dust, and so on. Um, I noticed tonight on front page form, or perhaps it was yesterday, there was uh, someone who queried about uh, demoing the building and how much that would cost. I would like... Um, a new location for this new building, and I would like it to be out of the floodplain. I don't think that's been looked at. Um, can we afford, yes, we can, to sell this building outright or perhaps do a 50 or 100 year lease, let someone else do the developing. And then um, lastly, uh, in the new configuration, there is uh, space allotted for two meetings. Currently this floor alone, six meetings can be held at the same time. Thank you. Mary, I have a question. Sure. At the beginning, you listed three things that you hold very near and dear, right? What about your garden? Food. That oh, comes under food? That's, that, that's just ingrain. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm like, one of them is going to be the garden. Yeah. Okay. Food, family, finance. Okay. The three Fs. Thank you. Okay. I think that would be fauna and flora. There they flora. Are. There we go. That would be four. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any other public comment from anybody present or on the Zoom? I'm not seeing any hands going up. Um, our next item on the agenda is additions, deletions, or modifications to the agenda. Does anybody have any? Okay, seeing none. Our agenda, then we will begin with item A, presentation of our fiscal year 23 audit. Josh, do you want to say anything before we call on Kathy? Um, just thanks to RHR for the time spent working on the FY23 audit, and I'm looking forward to Kathy's presentation this evening. Kathy, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, we Sometimes I'm not sure, especially with these Zoom meetings, but um, I just wanted to make sure that my microphone was on and everything was okay. So thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Kathy Markovich. I'm the firm director at RHR Smith & Company. Also on the call with us is Deborah Well, who was the audit manager for your audit this year, 2023. Um, did you mention that you all had the financial statements in front of you? Is that something that you have? Okay. Okay, perfect. So perfect. while we're going to be giving a brief um, audit summary of what happened. We're going to do a little bit of talk about the financial statement just in case uh, you didn't get a chance to look at it. So I wanted to start there because most times when we're doing an audit presentation, most people want us to focus on the numbers. And I'm not sure how often you've had anybody run through financial statements on the over on the overview with you, but most of the detailed information's in the back if you care to look there instead. So um, running from the back to the front is what we call the non-major funds. And so they're broken out by type in the back, permanent funds, fiduciary funds, and in your case, capital project funds. So scrolling from the back to the front, we have the balances that get seg um, summarized up into the front of the statements. But Happy when you want to look at the, oh, Happy I'm sorry. Time. Would it be helpful if I shared screen and, and tried to show the pages you're talking about? That is up to you because that's why I want to make sure. Sometimes people don't like the ones we, when we project them on the screen because they're really small. This is, but well, I'm so happy to have that part. Give me a page yep. number you're at so I can have a starting point. We'll oh, no problem. I'm in the back and now my screen just went off, but it's um, Schedule right. F. 
Oh, that's okay. About what page? I can are we roll on? with the text stuff, even at seven p.m. <laughs> okay, well, we're seventy-eight. Seventy-eight. Thank you. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. It starts sooner. That's okay. Well, we're in we're in the back of the statement, so we have a lot of the broken out schedules in the back, oh. starting with the permanent funds. And then we roll right. up to the capital projects funds, which are part of the 15 year plan that you all have put together. And Is this um, schedule F? Yes. Is it perfect. I don't Patrick. I don't spend a ton of time on there. I just know that when we discuss stuff with your staff, we do end up spending a lot of time on the capital projects and making sure that those are presented properly according to the way that we best understand it, the way your staff understands it. So we want to make sure that you guys know that they're back there and broken out versus in the front where everything's sort of lumped together the way that they're supposed to be for presentation of the financial statements. So the capital projects funds ended the year with a fund balance of $1,126,197, which we understand from Connie and your staff that that is um, a part of the 15 year plan that your town has for the capital projects. You have various special revenue funds that are also in the back and will be lumped together in the front, also including your ARPA funds, which have yet to be used at least at the end of 2023 in their entirety. So appropriately segregated in the back the way that we would expect to see them. And then there's a whole fun section of note disclosures, which um, sometimes when Ron is doing a presentation, he says things like, you know, it's it's kudos to anybody that read them. It's not that they're not important and that they don't mean something to all of us, but it's a lot of reading. So if any of you ever have any questions about the note disclosures, I'm happy to go over it. But it's not something we normally focus on when we're doing a financial statement presentation, even though there's a lot of information that's required because of the auditing standards that we have and the governmental accounting standards board requires us to have. It may or may not be pertinent to conversations you have on an operational basis, though. So if you keep scrolling up, although I'm happy to talk about pensions, that pension sure. liability, there we go, budget, budget schedules. There is one schedule for the highway fund. And the, um, the schedule right in front of it is the um, what's considered to be the general fund. And I know that um, we had quite a few discussions with your staff regarding the highway funds and the uses of the year, especially with the fact that you finally got the FEMA money that you'd been expecting from 2019, I believe, finally showed up. I'm not going to say that FEMA doesn't work on their own schedule, but it's certainly not on the schedule of everybody else. No offense to FEMA, if Big Brother is listening. So you had some funds that finally came in, and I know you had some further expenditures this year, which are also recorded in the highway fund. And then you have your general fund as well. That's um, on the separate page there presented, the budget to actual, which um, we had discussed some of the, I don't want to say variances, the positives and the negatives with your uh, management to make sure that we understood how things are being presented, that they were accurate. Any sort of um, larger variances like the police department and the fire department, we understood what was happening there so we could present that correctly. And we believe it is presented fairly. We also had some questions, I believe, about miscellaneous revenue that had come in for um, the bridges that was in the highway department, which we noted also. And it's accurately presented there, even though it's kind of hard to label things on a set of financial statements, even though your staff is well aware of what those items are and was able to clarify that for us with little question. Okay, if you want to keep scrolling, Josh, I thank you for running <laughs> part of it. Tell me where to go next. I'm following along. <laughs> you probably want to jump up quite a few pages, probably to... On if I get my PDF open, which it won't let me do right now because I'm looking at your screen, I'd say about 20 more pages. You could also share up. your screen if that would be easier. But either way. I don't want to rock the boat. I like it when the presentation is at least going and you guys can all see. Okay. That's perfectly fine. Like page 30 or page 30, you say? About there? He said about 20 pages up. I'm just spitballing. What's the header on the page we're looking for? It's the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances. <laughs> it's a mouthful. It. Just search going up a little bit further. Sorry. Uh, revenues, page 20. It shouldn't be too much further. We're getting to the top of the note disclosures. Oh, I see. I think it's okay. 20. Okay. Next net fund position. Five more pages. Here we go. Part says it's 20. Yep. Right. We're headed past proprietary fund statements, and then oh, that one. there we go. There we are. Mm -hmm. There's the big guy. 
where all of your fund balances, the governmental fund balances roll up into the upper statements. So all of the back ones that we looked at are totaled together into that other governmental funds column from the back to the front. And then you have some major funds that are presented separately based on calculations that we're required to do and based on any information that your staff gave us about things that they might like to see segregated as major funds in the front of the statements. So they show that the ending fund balances for all of your major funds, including all the non-majors, was $3,511,102 for the end of the year. And all of the categories and expenditures and revenues are classified appropriately as they've been presented. And if you scroll up two probably more pages to the fund balance balance sheet, it shows for those same major funds and also the non-majors any of the um, breakdowns in the fund balances that may have been applicable to those funds based on the ending balances for the year. Questions? Yeah. So thank you very much for um, uh, your presentation and all of this information. There is a lot to it. Um, yeah. I really only have one question, and the the you know, and the the purpose for me of having an outside auditor uh, review our books is to make sure that we have all the money that we are supposed to have, and there isn't some offshore account in Switzerland or the Cayman Islands where staff are stashing money away. Um, is uh, can you assure us that 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 is not the case, and that this is this confirms that uh, we we found all the money that we're supposed to have. Well, sir, I don't want to take on an act that's more powerful than what I can do in my personal and professional capacity. But I can tell you that through the audit procedures that we are required to do and the ones that maybe we choose to do during the audit, we found no evidence of that. And one of which, of course, is confirming cash at any of the local as well as a little bit further out institutions that have your tax ID number on them. All of those are properly recorded on the town's books as is required by governmental accounting standards board and generally accepted accounting principles to the best of our knowledge. Thank you so much. I'll sleep better tonight. And you've also <laughs> given us the recommendations on accounting controls and Connie has already prepared a response to that, but there were no major, there were no major deficiencies in our controls that you were able to see. No, sir, not from the test work that we were able to do and any of the audit procedures that we were able to um, perform. No, we recommended the items to you that we believed were the ones that stood out to us, but there was nothing I would consider to be major. And if you if you get to the point where you read the independent auditor's report, which is further up in the statements, and once again is happy reading, if you feel so inclined, we did issue an unmodified report, which means the financial statements are accurately presented to the best of our knowledge at this time with the information that we have. We're going to bring that up here just a sec. And oh, sure. <laughs> that is a separate document, I yeah. think, from the actual... Right. Yeah. Is that the management letter, Matthew? Is there the management letter is a separate document from the financial statements? Correct? That's what we're looking for right now, right? I think with the with the advice. I was no. referencing the independent auditor's report, which is issued in the front of the financial statements. But I believe what your um, what your I believe it's the chair. I don't remember if I caught that when you're going around, but it was re mentioning was the management letter, which is a separate letter itself right. because it's, it's based off of recommendations right. for internal control. ML two three, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll share this. And then Connie's responses are. We're looking at. Yeah, Connie's are at the end of that document. The bank reconciliation. So that's right. Okay. Yes, this one. And this is an attachment uh, or a uh, link on our agenda to the meeting, so people can yep. find it there. It's also under the finance page on the website. Right, and the, if you're at home watching and you go to our Richmond website for the select board, this is document three A three. And then, so there's the findings, there's the responses. The responses from Connie and your staff were acceptable to us as corrective action and seemed to be a good path to us moving forward. <clears throat> June? Thank you. Um, well, one question was about the management letter, but that's been answered. Thank you so much. My other question is under, on the balance sheet, it says investments of 1 million. And I know that the when I was on the select board last year, we had determined that um, we would be putting money into CDs. And I'm guessing that that's what that 1 million is. But I also thought that it was 
there was going to be a series of deposits into CDs and it was going to be more than a million. Am I wrong on that? No, we did three different installments of $500,000 CDs, each one. And Connie might remember the timing better. Did we only do two of those during FY23? Mm -hmm. And that's why we have a million dollars. And then the third one was in maybe July of 20 and the start of 24. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Okay. Jeff. Um, on the manage in the management letter, it talks about um, that for bank reconciliations and uh, journal entries, um, that uh, it sh it should be reviewed um, by an employee other than the preparer mm -hmm. as well. Is so do we do that? Do we have an employee who can do that? This is one of the challenges that, you know, Connie has mentioned to me is that, mm -hmm. you know, she, she knows it all, but do it, does someone else, uh, is someone else able to do all of it? Right. That? Is that something we can pay Jim to do? Or? Well, so I'll, I'll let Connie respond, but I, I look at the bank reconciliations and I believe Jim does it as well. Right. Uh, but Connie, you might be able to have yeah. more detail on that response. Are you still here? So. I start the bank reconciliation, and then um, way back before I came on, Lori Brisbane comes in and reviews the bank reconciliation and any adjustments that had to be done. She signs the bank statement, showing that she's reviewed it for me before we click the button on the NEMRIC bank reconciliation feature. And then we um, put that along with a bunch of other documents in a folder with every general journal entry that has been done. And that goes into Josh. And then Josh goes through all those documents, puts a whole bunch of questions on them. And then he and I sit down and address any of the questions he's had. So we've actually gone above and beyond where we have to. We have three people involved in the process. The town treasurer is not involved in that process, but it's the documents are available to him anytime he wants to see them. That's right. I misspoke. It, it's Lori, not Jim. I right. misremember. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Right. Are there things we want to catch and go over? Um, I didn't have anything in particular. We might be all done. Kathy, we, we appreciate the level of detail that is in your audit and I confess that I have not read every page of it since we got it, but um, okay, third read. I appreciate your honesty. It's okay. <laughs> and I, we appreciate the opportunity to work with your town. There's, your staff has been really easy to work with, and we look forward to working with you all again in the future. Fortunately, this audit's really good for helping my insomnia, which is a good thing. Okay, Thank but not you, to Kat. not to make too much light of this for people listening at home or watching this recording later. Um, all the documents that um, are being referenced here tonight are currently in the, um, as Josh has said, they're currently on the finance department page. Is that correct? Um, I think they're on the finance and they're also on the select board packet. And they're on the select board packet for this week, but if you're looking somewhere down the road, there'd be a little, they'd be buried a little further, but they should be on the finance. Let me make sure before, I, I'm pretty sure they're on the finance. Um, you want to share it if they are there? They will be yeah, soon. let me see. I know I put them on the website. I just can't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay, I can share a screen. Sure, people were to get there. Um, so, whoa, oh, that's not what I wanted. How did that get up there? I don't know. In case we're not done watching the thing about the, yeah, about the water and sewer meeting. All right, <laughs> let me get back to this. All right, so just to give a, a quick um, if you go to departments, you go to finance, and then you scroll down to reports, and everything from the FY23 report is here that we just reviewed. And if you want to go back to previous years, there's documents from previous years as well. But these are the three documents right here that we've reviewed most recently. Mm -hmm. And if anybody watching, as I like to say, watching or watching later, does have questions about any of these documents, the audit, the management letter, et cetera, um, our town finance director... Uh, our town manager, town staff will be happy to answer questions. We we appreciate and welcome the scrutiny. Bonnie? And also in the responses that we gave um, for the management letter, just for our auditors, now at the last meeting, they did do a vote and a couple of, of select board members have agreed 
to work with me on updating those policies um, that we talked about in our response to the management letter. Excellent. I love updated policies. I'm sorry. I'm such a nerd like that, but I do. I appreciate the efforts that the town of Richmond is making in that direction. And Connie, you, you were excellent to work with. I just want to say that up front. I appreciate your efforts and what you're doing for the town of Richmond made the audit a, a smooth process for us. Okay. And the aforementioned select board members who will be working with Connie on this are David Sander and Lisa Miller. Um, just for the record. Well, if you need any input, as always, Connie knows where to find us. Okay. We're happy to help. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, everybody who read this. And thank you, Connie, for all the work, Connie and Josh and all the town staff, for all the work they put into taking part in this and making it a success. Yep. And thank you to Deb, because she was here on site as we piled up all the documents. <laughs> Joy, didn't I thank you as well? <laughs> <clears throat> Very okay. helpful. Right. Can you make that go away? Oh. We apparently just into the water and sewer meeting. Oh no, I think that it, it oh okay. It like caught up to itself and said it, it's it's done. Well no, what I'm doing when I get home. It's all like loaded in the cloud. Yep. Magic. Okay. Um our next item is review of second quarter fiscal year twenty four financial reports. So Connie, I'm assuming that's you. Uh, yeah, usually Josh walks you through it. Um, Josh will be welcome. Yeah, I can give sort of a high level. Uh, obviously, we provided a, uh, what, about 11 different documents into the packet. Um, so there's there's tons of information. Happy to answer any questions on that if we can't answer it this evening. We can certainly dig into it. Um, the two that I find most helpful is the budget status report for both general and highway. Uh, Connie goes through every quarter, makes a lot of notes on there as far as uh, things that she's seeing, but just a sort of a high level kind of recap. In the general fund, um, we'll see that there's large interest payments that have been coming in that due to continued high interest as well as those aforementioned certificates of deposit. We continue to get interest on those, Bard. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share it. As you're starting, I think it would be worth sharing yeah. because I think some comments will come up, come sure. up about formatting and maybe some questions. Okay. Um, so interest, uh, where we at with, uh, interest rates here. So we had budgeted for 14,000 and just to go over before, I think those were more water sure questions. I'm not sharing. I need to share. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so just a, a note, uh, we had some questions in water and sewer that we didn't really get to, but this report shows, um, the first six months of the fiscal year. So this is period six. Which document is this? Could you go to the very top? Yeah. So that's the first question for the uninitiated. Mm -hmm. And it has the header here. It says current year period six. Does that kind of mean six months? Yes. That's December. That's December. So, so it's through December. Yep. So fiscal mm -hmm. year started in July. Period six is December. So it's halfway through the fiscal year 24. So this would not include anything that may have been entered after January 1st Correct. or for expenses and revenues after January 1st. Right? Correct. Yep. So this is looking at a full, complete six months, but no more. Um, the budget is the complete budget for the fiscal year. The actual is the amount that has been spent through the end of December or revenue realized. Um, so when you look at the percentage of budget, a lot of times what I'm sort of scanning through here is, you know, are things around 50% because we're halfway through the year? If they are, they're probably on track. If they're over or under, what's the reason? Um, except for property taxes, I think we adjusted that because there was confusion before. We wanted to know more where are we at with property taxes year to date. So that I believe, oh, no, sorry, Connie, I'm wrong. That's the full year, but we all, this is the weird accounting thing that we always put in the full amount because it's billed. It's a strange thing with Nemeric. Um, we have another report on how much we've actually received in property taxes in a separate document. Um, so this is billed for revenues? It, it, so for only for property taxes. The rest of it is actually money received. So in, 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 when you look down here at interest, um, which is where I was going, we budgeted 14,000 for the total year. We have received 85,000 total for the year to date. So we're, we're well over the budget. I think property taxes are the only anomaly like that, right, Connie, that I can think of that we should yes. build and realize. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm very pleased by that one line. Um, projected interest, 14,000. Actual interest, 85,000. Yeah. Let's hear it for interest rates going up. Interest rates and the CDs. As you're buying a house. That's true. That's very true. Um, 
Another, we, we have the sale of police cruisers in here at about uh, $9,000 on a budget of 5,000. So those are the two, the two cruisers that we have sold. Um, one thing on, vac on savings, as we look at police department, obviously we have a large amount of vacancy savings. Let me get down to where the police is. Yeah, uh, in bold and large letters. Um, just to summarize, we have about $177,000 in salaries uh, that we've saved alone, or about $278,000 total saved. Uh, but we spent $117,000 on contracted services. So there's sort of a rough net savings of about $161,000 on the personnel side of policing. Okay. Um, and then in fire, I noted that they were a little up in their salaries. But uh, that mostly, I think, was due to flooding events that we they spent a lot of time in July working a lot of extra hours. Uh, I think they've also had, in general, more calls. And, and a chainsaw. And they, a chainsaw? It was in the warrants. Okay. And they continue to um, increase their staffing over there as well. So hopefully, I think they're getting more people trained and more people uh, to respond. That is tremendous. That's, so, that's very good to hear. There's yeah. a lot of other notes there, but those are a few that I reviewed just to sort of call out to the board and the public this evening. Um, we can go on to highway. Jeff has a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, before we move on. Yeah. So, um, where does workers' comp show up in, in this for any of our departments? Yeah, I think there's a separate. Is it passive? It, it passive passive is, is who working. administers it. Salaries, life. Money's not in like crazy. It's passive. Yeah, passive. <laughs> All right. So it's included in here, right? Then, Connie? Yeah. And we, yeah. Okay. So. And there's another line. For the next department. Well, that's not yeah. property insurance. That's that's workers' comp. Well, it's so that passive line is allocated. It's a combination of property casualty and, and the small amount that goes to workers' comp as well as in there. Well, because it's under fire, it's substantial. As I I think. Let me see where there's fire. Our department payroll. We'll look for smoke where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm. It's either substantial or I don't see it at all. I mean, I, it, look, it looked to me like I think I saw. So we had VLCT passive insurance. Is it under buildings? Under buildings and grounds. Under you buildings and grounds, isn't it? And so, like, but does it show up under fire? You just search for the word passive. Well, this is. Yeah, passive is under. Isn't that. I don't know. Right, so I don't know. So, right? so our real... chart of accounts is not in really good order. And that's one of the projects I want to take on. Maybe this year I'll have the time to completely redo it. Because when Nemric was new to us, a lot of stuff was really not input as it should. And it's not something you can willy-nilly go back and change. So would I put passive under buildings and grounds? Probably not. So are you looking at this one here? Uh, Jeff, wondering why we're at 77% spent already on VLCT passive. Is this the one you're looking at? Yeah. Under buildings so, and grounds. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if it were, you know, even the buildings, you know, if we pay $7,000 or $9,000 a year on the building, you pay off the building pretty quickly. It's mm -hmm. not that valuable a building. So if it's, if it's workers comp, that makes a certain amount of sense to me. Yeah. And it might, and I'm I'm just wondering if workers' comp is you know by hours or by staff or how does that work? So and Connie, you might be able to dive into it more, but that also there's an assigned risk pool for fire departments. Oh, so I right. think we actually pay a little bit more on the workers' comp due to the nature of the yeah, work that they're doing. Um, so we can dive into that and get you a better report on exactly what we pay for that assigned risk pool that, that's billed separately, but that's included in this line, I believe, right, Connie? Right. I, and, you know, passive also pertains to the building, to the fire trucks. It, there's a lot of things that fall into that insurance category. No, I would a a actually expect that to be higher um, if, it, if it pertains to workers' comp for firefighters. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do I know? I can send you the bills for it so you can kind of take a look right, at where we're at. I, I won't spend any more time. But, it, but again, we do have breakouts for where all that goes. Right. And some of the charges are based on history. And we don't have many fire department workers' comp claims. Uh, anything else? Sorry, we both knocked at the same time. Um, not wanting to do the first responder jinx of it's quiet. Um, 
anything else on general and we can jump into highway for a bit sure. okay so on highway <clears throat> The ones that I looked at as far as under budget, as we get down into gravel, salt, and sand. And when we have those. So you'll see gravel, we're underspent, salt is here, and sand as well. Um, so gravel. He didn't get a lot of uh, road work done this summer and fall due to the flooding and due to the recoveries there. So we didn't use as much as we normally would have. So that a lot of that work will be deferred towards the spring. So we'll expect to see that line go up a little bit higher. Salt, we've just had sort of a, a light winter so far for salt needs. Um, hasn't been a lot of icing, hasn't been a lot of need for that. So that line is down. Um, sand, again, he still has a pile that he's working off of from last winter. Uh, that one, I think he just bought some more, so we'll start to see that start to climb back up, but again, sort of directly related to the winter. And then stormwater and sidewalks is another line that is down, and again, that's really due to work that they weren't able to get to last summer and fall due to recovery from flooding. So first projects in the spring are going to be related to stormwater sidewalks and then paving, which we didn't get to last year either. We'll do that first part of the spring so we still fit that into this fiscal year. Um, also on sidewalks is the work up on Route 2 that he was hoping to get to last year, but we'll do that next year. I think part of that is combining up with the VTrans work on Route 2 as well. So those are some large numbers that are keeping that budget a little bit lower on expenses at this point. One thing to keep in mind with the highway budget is uh, we need to remember that we budgeted for, what was it, 500000 in restricted funds to be used towards the budget. So now that we're at the half year mark, we're going to start seeing our cash going down. Mm -hmm. Is is that where that five hundred thousand dollars at the summary is? Is that that's for that fiscal is? year twenty four? Yes. In fiscal year twenty three, it went mostly to the general fund, but in twenty four, it all um, everything we used was going towards the highway fund. Obvious reasons, yeah. Right. Okay. So, there's other questions on other documents or anything on these. It's the same the same question on passive for this one. This one is actually quite quite a bit higher. It's twenty five thousand. Okay. Yeah, we can send out a detailed breakdown of where the passive goes because it's it's a package, and there's weird math to how they calculate it. I have a whole spreadsheet for uh, whenever they send us an invoice of how we allocate it to all the different departments. It. Uh, it gets complicated, but I can share that with you and you can see. Mm -hmm. It's okay. also usually attached to the invoice when we pay it. It's one of the backup documents. Right. All right. Okay. Any other questions or things to share, Connie, or members of the select board about our second quarter financial statements? Any questions from the public either? Okay. Then I guess we are going to move on to the third item on our agenda, which has to do with Hillview, the Hillview Heights subdivision. Um, on January 16th, um, we had Mr. Hold, Mr. Pelletier, who are here with us tonight, come up for the select board to ask some questions about some of the permitting for the accesses for the sight lines for the hammerhead turnaround. Um, for the name of the road that would go into that subdivision. And many of these questions um, were outside our direct experience, but we have a very experienced town zoning administrator who is with us tonight. Um, Tyler Mesha was good enough to prepare a document reviewing each of the groups of questions that that um, Mr. Pelletier submitted. And Tyler, what would you say would be the best way to sum this up? Do you want me to go section by section through the document, or do you have a more high-level summary that you want to give? Um, I'll defer to you on, on that, Jay. I mean, my initial memo that I wrote the uh, you know first time was uh, was more of a summary version, so this one was more of a intended to be a little bit more of a deep dive. Um, kind of, I can attempt to you know, if uh, offer a brief summary. Um, so 
in essence, there was a series of questions that have been raised per periodically, both uh, both in Mr. Holt's most recent letter and throughout the subdivision process. Uh, the one that we really found to have somewhat more of substance was a, uh, what really boiled down to a, a misinterpretation of section 6.2.1e of the Richmond zoning regulations. Um, and the reason for that, there's a bit of a contradiction in the language in that it references both the B-71 standards and our public work standards. Um, and this is regarding site, line, site distances. So B-71 allows a range of site distances for, uh, um, for, uh, for curb cuts, and that's between 250 and 390. However, our public work specs have a minimum uh, stopping a uh, curb cut uh, to the site distance of 385. So whenever and through a lot of back and forth, I had, you know, through kind of advice from our, um, some legal advice is that whenever there's a conflict between state and local regulations, typically whichever is the, is the more stringent, applies. So that's kind of like the same with our floodplain regs, right? Right, is that there's more, the overlay district is more strict than the underlying district. So the overlay district in this case would would trump it. So in this, because 385 was more uh, was more stringent than what the state had, is we had to go with 385. As a result of that, and the applicants are here tonight, they could speak more to that. Um, they had applicants had to redesign the site distance to confirm that 385, which they did and submitted plans to do so. Um, the rest of the issues that are brought up, really access to lots three, there really isn't anything for you guys to consider on that. Um, my memo goes into more detail. I'm happy to expand, expand on that if needed. Um, the access for lots four to seven, that's pretty cut and dry. Uh, basically, the because the subdivision was approved in the original zoning permit to upgrade that access was never completed but any conditions on that are kind of voided and the applicants you're, you're allowed to to change your your application as, as many times as you want provided that you go through the the proper procedures to do so um the applicants did that have a final subdivision approval therefore they're free to pull uh, permits for uh, for any of the new work that they do. They don't need a permit for lot three. Um, they do for four to seven. They had to come in and we'll have to pull a new zoning permit for that. Um, as far as the hammerhead turnaround, again, there was a little bit of a misread in the regulation. So the way it works is where a public road starts or a private road starts is when it serves four or more houses. And where it ends is where it stops serving four or more houses. So if you look at the original plant, the plan set for the subdivision, you'll notice that the road runs and serves lots four, five, four and five, then comes up to the six and seven. And then six, it, ham it terminates at a hammerhead there because beyond that, it only serves um, two lots, one being lot six. One being lot seven. Lot seven does have a agricultural access on it as well. Yvonne's have a flower farm. They have RAPs from the state. So in the eyes of the state, they are a farm. And there's a, another offshoot of that, which will serve the single family home. So in, in, in essence, that's, uh, that, those are the more, the main points. Lots, you know, there was an issue with lots one and two, and we've addressed that. I've also attached some draft conditions you guys can consider, which would basically say you would approve it. Um, under the condition that the applicants go to the development review board and amend their subdivision application, um, which they are in the process of doing. Or what? Um, Cut down on the trees. You mute. Yeah, Nathaniel, if you just mute. Thank you. Got him. Um, so essentially, that's what uh, that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Okay, so we amending the request to bring it into line with 385 feet and Pete will verify that it actually is 385 feet. And I'll make that a condition of the zoning permit too. I mean, we can just bake it into 
to everything, basically. I'm going to require them to amend their homeowner's agreement language to specifically state that they will clear to 385, that there's no ambiguity as to what has to be cleared to. Okay. Keeping on going down, to, I guess we're now um, heading on down to the hammerhead turnaround issue. Just covered that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Keep going then. I'm Access following the hammerhead and road name. Right. right yeah. Right. Road name. There really wasn't any, any issue with that. So it's as a general rule, right? The applicants pick the road name and I run it by E911 to see whether or not there's any problems. Now, obviously they may prefer it to be named something different, but there's a difference between having a preference and saying that one will work over the other. And it's clear from that email that Tyler sent that on the one hand, he says it could be a little, it could be better named, but it, it would work as a general rule. That's kind of how we, you know, we defer. I mean, you guys can require a different name if you'd like, but as a general rule, there's a good bit of deference given to the applicant as to what the name of the, uh, the road name is going to be. And that's pretty common practice. Uh, there's the uh, far subdivision up on phase corners where they had to come in and originally I was going to give it a name and then E9 wants to know, let them pick it. And we, we swapped it around. So that's pretty, that's pretty common. The fact that Hillview Heights way or Hillview Heights would be right off of Hillview and not in some other part of the town makes it, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I know historically that's been one of the problems with E911, Elm Street and Elm Road, and they're opposite ends of the town. Of course, E911 got rid of that level of ambiguity, but in this case, if you're on Hillview and you're looking for an address in Hillview Heights and you're a rescue squad, I, you're mm -hmm. kind of in the right place. Yeah, but, and I think it's, again, I think it's different enough. It's not Hillview Heights Lane or it's Hillview Heights Way, you know what I mean? It's, some, it's not like Hillview Road or Hillview Heights Road. Or something where it's really, really close. Right. So Hillview Heights Way. Okay. Well, the select board will have to choose whether they want to approve that. We have a draft motion, but um, let's keep on going down. Okay. Just to the end. That's and that's the end. about it. Okay. So questions from the select board? Questions from... I'll go ahead, Jeff. Well, I just have a process question. So um, all of this does seem like it can and should and was addressed in the DRB meeting uh, proceeding, except for the access permit. So am I correct on that? That is correct. So we do look at accesses, but again, it's, it's so it's kind of weird because it's a cursory kind of look because again, ultimately you guys approve the accesses. And to be clear, if there's any takeaway from this is that, and I think me, Keith and, you know, and the DRB are, are going to be working on this, at least internally, is to figure out a better pathway to kind of go about getting these approved. Because it does seem odd that you'd go through all the way through your preliminary and final, get approved for the subdivision, have to, and then you guys, for whatever reason, decide to have an applicant switch their, uh, switch their access around. Um, and then they have to come back and amend their final subdivision again. So what I think we're going to start working on in future is having them come in after their preliminary uh, preliminary approval. And then what we would have you guys do is if you do approve them, just put the we'll just start baking this condition into all of them that this approval is contingent upon final subdivision approval. So that way we kind of, once we get the final subdivision approval, all the eyes are kind of, dotted and crossed and that we everybody's aware of kind of what's going on so there isn't any we hopefully don't run into this issue again so i think you answered it so but but yeah my question would be like why you know i mean why would the select board weigh in on this one way or the other if uh, the applicant and the public has had ample opportunity during the DRB process? Um, that's an excellent question. And the reason for that is because it says so in the regs. And it says so in the regs because the sky's blue. I, I, I don't really have a, a good answer for you as to the logic behind why it's there. However, it does explicitly state that you guys have to approve accesses. For example, if the applicant said, instead of doing a hammerhead turnaround, it decided to put a cul-de-sac in, then the development review board would have approved it. And it wouldn't even be before you. 
the hammerhead is the one that really confuses me. Yeah, that's I, I don't. I, I I cannot speak as to the logic. I can just say as to that it is it is in there. I will observe that while it may seem arbitrary, this is a misquote of an old movie that goes in the proper southern accent. The law is the law. <laughs> There's also the quote that anybody who enjoys sausage or the law should not watch either being made. Um, but I regret that. It's, but I know that these are real world issues that affect real world people. And so I don't want to take too much light of them. Um, I'm going to make a video if that's all right. For some reason, I'm sideways and it's really, uh, really distracting. <laughs> I was afraid the blood was going to your head, Tyler. No, I don't know why it's doing that. But here, I'm just going to do that. So okay. it's what the regs currently say. Arguably, the regs can be changed, but that's why. Why is it? Because that what that's what the regs currently direct. Yeah, so and I again, I can't speak as to the whether or not those make sense. You know, taking my at the risk of overstepping, I would probably say that you know maybe that's something that we could look at as to whether or not you guys want to approve them whether there's a better vehicle to do that i don't know if there's a state statute that would require you guys to do that but if you felt that it was better use it because again as most of these go from my understanding they're usually pretty cursory and that it usually takes you know a couple minutes generally speaking to approve them it may be you know worth looking at formalizing that but at least in the in the short term you know bar that's a much more involved process but i think in the short term we can develop a little work around that would make sure that uh you know that we're providing the review at least up front so that way we make the process a little easier i think and more more clear for the applicant as to kind of what's going to go go on and that way you guys are looking at it everybody's approved and again that that's not going to save them if the drb decides to amend it on the final they'd still have to come back and amend it with you guys but we could you know we could try and figure out a way to to minimize that Okay, so just to um, kind of bring us down to brass tacks, there were a lot of questions, and hopefully we've gotten sufficient answers. We have a draft motion. I'm not trying to rush to call the question. I'm just wanting to put in front of us what the draft motion says, um, because we the, we don't we can't compete with the DRB on, on their turf, but we approve access permits, road names, and hammerhead turnarounds. And so the draft motion is to move to approve the following for Hillview Heights subdivision, access permit 2024-01 with conditions as stated in the attachment to that permit, access permit 202402, comma, the road name Hillview Heights Way for the road that accesses lots four through seven, comma, and the hammerhead turnaround for the road that accesses lots four through seven. So those are what we would be voting on if someone chooses to make that oh, motion. Wait. Okay, Jeff has made that motion. Do I have a second? By Bard, I will second. Okay, so we have a motion for Jeff Ford, seconded by Bard Hill for that motion, which I just read. Okay, go ahead. Somebody have a question? Okay, so would you or anybody else present like to comment or ask questions? Okay. Well, for those of whom we don't know, we have Bradley Holt, uh, the one that wrote the letter or the comments that the select board and Tyler's responding to. Um, so I just want to share a few things. So this subdivision has been in the work since the beginning of 2021. And one of the rare times that I felt any public official or permitting authority has listened to what we have to say about or taken what we have to say about this or taken our concerns seriously uh, was at your last select board meeting. Um, I, I appreciate that you already have spent a fair amount of time on this topic. And I understand that it may not be productive to continue to debate each element of the applications before you. Uh, my concerns related to your consideration of approval of these applications, as outlined in my January 21st letter, uh, stand on their own. Uh, you have before you a memo from Tyler attempting to rebut what I what I outlined in my letter. Uh, throughout this entire process, we have witnessed an enormous bias in favor of the developer on the part of our town's permitting authorities. Uh, nothing we say or bring forward seems to matter, no matter how comprehensive our evidence or how obvious the facts are that we share. Uh, the developer has given every benefit of the doubt, and we are characterized as simply not wanting this development and that our concerns are foolish and unfounded. What you have before you in plain view is a highly biased memo that goes out of its way to defend the developer and to paint not just my claims, but me personally in a negative light. This memo is just one more insult in a long line of injuries by this town's permitting authorities over the last three years. 
I have been demeaned, uh, yelled at, and now slandered by our town's permitting authorities throughout this process. I ask that you, I, I understand that you asked Tyler to write this memo, but he chose to say to, what to say in it. And what he chose to write demonstrates a stunning lack of judgment and a deficit of underlying subject matter knowledge. So I'm not gonna spend time tonight repeating this memo line by line. And to be clear, there is quite a lot to refute. But I want to address the claims of the memo attacking my personal motives. Uh, that's I, when you were looking through the document, there was a conclusion section um, that you didn't go through. Um, but this that section was completely inappropriate, uncalled for, and demonstrates the biased nature of the me of this memo. I, I have said quite a lot throughout this process over the last three years in many different venues and to many different authorities. I've been consistent throughout in my intent to reach an outcome that is acceptable to our entire neighborhood and conforms to the town and state requirements. I have spent countless hours on this, and to anyone paying attention to the work that I've done, it should be quite clear that this work has not been simply to benefit me personally. To back up his attack of my motives, Tyler quotes only one portion of one statement in one letter of mine from almost a year ago. The scenic views and pastoral landscapes that I referenced in that letter from almost a year ago are a concern for many, many other people, and not just for me personally. And my sentence that Tyler quoted did not end at the point where he, he ended his quote. I continued on that same sentence to address concerns related to class two wetland impacts and stormwater impacts on abutting neighbors. Quoting my full sentence would have been inconvenient to the memo's narrative. I hope that you see this memo for what it is and will be thoughtful in how you proceed with your consideration of its content. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any thoughts from the select board? I would only observe that I think um, our role is defined in our regulations that it's the three elements before us and there are elements not currently before us that are of concern. Um, and there are appeal rights that sort of go through that separate process, separate from what um, we sort of own here, the three before us of the access permits. And we've talked about conditions here today. Um, the hammerhead turnaround, we have an explanation such as it is, and um, I believe an opinion from the highway uh, folks, and the road name, which arguably is a subjective decision, meeting the minimum standards. But I, those are really the three elements that we have the authority to address directly. I, think. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Are there any questions or comments from anybody else on the select board? I'd just like to make a comment. You know, we, we have we have a lot of complex modern problems to deal with, and we hire qualified staff to do the, the hardest ones. And we've got to we see their performance, we trust their answers, and we have to do that. Or you know, they don't they shouldn't be here. And I'm not qualified really to second guess any of those professionals. Maybe if I take the time to educate myself up to a higher level, I would be, but meanwhile, there's 40 other things that I need done. So uh, I feel, I don't feel like we are doing a bad job of that. We're doing a lot of work with a fairly small staff with a very efficient uh, uh, salary structure. And I think we're getting more than the money's worth. Are we perfect? No, we're not. Or maybe this is a case where we're not perfect. Okay. Um, are you ready for the motion? Okay, the motion is as moved by, I apologize, was it by Jeff, Jeff and seconded by David? Bart. By Bart, Bart. Sorry. Motion made by Jeff Ford, seconded by Bart Hill to move to approve the following for the Hillview Heights subdivision access permit 202401 with conditions as stated in the attachment to the permit. Access permit 202402, the road named Hillview Heights Way, for the road that accesses lots four through seven, and the Hammerhead turnaround for the road that accesses lots four through seven. Please state your name and your vote. This is Jeff I. Bard I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Thank you. Uh, our next item on the agenda is one I'm sure you've all been waiting for because these guys have put in a lot of work and it's a topic everybody talks about, parking. Um, we have John Cohn, John Rankin, and Chuck Gilroy here from the Parking Committee, if you all would like to come up. And Diane. Oh, and Diane. And Diane's also here from the, Diane Mariano is also here from the uh, 
for uh josh would you um part of it right there yeah well what are you going to share screen yeah yeah then that's fine if you want to sit there you can share a screen will it go out yep it sure will how does this work or if, are you joined signed into the meeting zoom? yeah if you join by zoom and then there's an option to share your screen do you know oh we do thing? have the presentation oh, do I, be, oh I do is yeah, it the same one you said i can i can share it then if that's you easier can produce just, the production we're ready here. Let me do that. Yeah, um, there's a lot of button pushing. Yeah, let me. Uh, we get behind I, the curtain, but we don't have yeah. a curtain. He went to, he went to the Vanna Heights School of Button Pushing. Me, do you mind? Uh, uh, no, I got you. Do you mind if I push the button? Oh, if you want to push the buttons, sure, we can let you push it's the buttons. It's all about pushing the buttons. It's all about the buttons. I got you. Uh, there's a lot of um, I Jay, well, this is being <laughs> queued up. I just want to say that this is a great example of community involvement, teamwork, collaboration. Uh, we had a problem. A uh, very substantial problem that was brought to our attention, uh, but quite frankly, we had a lot going on, and we didn't have the ability to give the situation the due diligence it deserved. And these people stepped forward and said, "We'll take this on." And I've I've been very impressed by the work that's generated out of this group and the success that we've had working together and collaboratively working through solutions that, oh. admittedly, aren't perfect, but everybody can live with. Eva, uh, you're you're in. I'm in. Pushed a okay. few more buttons, and now you get to push the big button. Okay. Yeah, I, the button. So I, I just like to agree with what David said. Um, this has been, it, it's one of those peace in the Middle East kind of things. Having Solving parking to the satisfaction of everyone is not easy. We spend a lot of time at this table talking about things that aren't working and why. It's nice to take some time and devote it to something that is working and I think working quite well. You think that at the end. <laughs> so I stand by it. Yeah. You have the comment. Thank you very much. So uh, we are the uh, uh, the Recreational Parking Advisory Committee, and I want to underscore recreational. Um, everyone here is, is here except for Matt Buckley, who is down with the, uh, and recuperating. Um, uh, we've been in business for uh, since 2020. So it was yeah. going into our fourth year. And as we've gotten custom accustomed to coming back at the end of the year and saying what next what's happened in the last four years well so um what i was going to do is uh you know this is a collaboration of all of us and please break in we were just going to try to do a real fast rundown of the things that happened this year and what's on the plate and i'll start out with this is the map that actually the the qr code if you go into the parking areas it points to it's pointed to on the website and it's been updated to reflect this. And it's had thousands of, uh, it's interesting to see, it's had thousands of uh, visits, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do is go through, um, let's see if we can, uh, is there a way to change the, the, the oh, banner? Yeah, the banner. Oh yeah, gotcha. you can just shrink What that. I'm gonna do is go through in um, in alphabetical order. Uh, so, and, and just a lot of these places have had not much happen, but we're gonna report them um, the first one is the Beacon Preserve, uh, the, uh, the Richmond Land Trust, and um, not much happened there this year, except that they are exploring moving the canoe access, which is down in that parking area, up to the new parking area, which they've been cleared mm -hmm. up, and we're just waiting on that, and, uh, you know, that'll that'll provide a lot of extra parking, but that's on on them. Uh, we, we continue to work very closely with them. Um, the next one, just in, in alphabetical order, because there's no better is Brown's Court, which is brand new onto our plate. Uh, there's a, the ball field up there. I think it's a unappreciated piece of property. It's pretty interesting. And so we're playing in a, a, we've been introduced into this Brown's Court committee and we're going to play an advisory role. There's discussions about how to accommodate with parking either on the street or in the property. And we'll have more to report through the year. Um, checkered house parking, um, but uh, you can add it, you guys, whenever you want that in. Um, this, uh, we worked with VTrans and the highway department on some issues around the swale, um, but that was back in May. Anything you want to add there? Just a, no. no, okay. Um, but what one of the things that we're doing next is that we kind of want to brighten it up a little bit, put in better signage and the ropes are kind of like, it's kind of an entry the, to the town. So we're going to brighten it up. It, it is kind of interesting because it's not Richmond property, it's VTrans property, but we, we think we can do that in a way, and it's only seasonal, but it'll be more inviting. That's another example of collaboration. Uh, I was driving by one day and I saw a lot of people talking over there. So I went over and 
VTrans said, you can't, you can't park here. But by the time it came to the select board, you had already worked around a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you can work back. with VTrans. We ought to hire these guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dugway Road, nothing happened there. So, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, so a lot has happened there. And we spent a lot of time on it. As you may recall, when we started, when we did this talk last year, we were kind of like, are we done? Can we go? And you guys said, what about Dugway Road? Well, it's, we haven't had a normal summer since we started this. Right. For, but, what we did is we spent a lot of time um, looking at where the parking could be legal and what our main concern was primarily was safety. Right. There was problems with people parking on both sides of the road and that uh, emergency vehicles couldn't get through. So we surveyed, we did a lot of surveying of where legal parking could be in terms of off of the, the road. And what we determined is on the uphill side uh, uh, away from the river, there was only very few parking that could even be considered legal. So right. what we decided to do and with uh, select board in input, uh, we uh, wrote an ordinance and, and it passed to uh, block uh, the uphill parking over a period of, uh, it's about one and a half miles? Two miles. Two miles. Um, that's, you know, you know, there's a begin sign and an end sign. Um, and we made that that ordinance was passed in March. Uh, they made the town made a press release in May. We placed the signage for Pete's Health in June. And one of the things that we and then we watched. And again, it was a kind of an unusual summer, but uh, we have uh, actually data on the enforcement and stuff. And it, it, it tended to, it seemed to be working, but we really need a regular summer to figure it out. Um, one feedback that we have gotten, and we spent time talking to. Um, Andy Squires, you know, the town constable, is that uh, we've heard from people, he's heard from people that the sign, the signage needs to be a little bit clear. We're trying to balance. We don't want too much signage. You know, the, the local, the neighborhood doesn't want that. So uh, Chuck's been just driving. Well, we've got some additional signage, so it's to be a little bit more and a little bit clearer about the intent. Maybe fewer words, uh, more pictures, <laughs> unambiguous. <laughs> so we're, that's what's next in the shop. So one of the one of the issues we have there is we have this two mile section that, that thankfully you approved. This is no parking on the side of the road. It's a little bit diluted in the fact that there are still parking signs there that say no parking, and there are parking signs there in between that area that say no parking on travel portion of the road. So I'm actually going to meet with Pete tomorrow morning, and we're doing a, a drive up there, and we're going to have a we're going to standardize that signage in right. that two mile area uh, just to make it a little clearer. Andy's been been a huge help with this um, from his perspective he gives, he gives us good looks at things yeah we have a couple of people who are sort of you know uh unofficial members i mean pete and andy have been very very helpful and lisa has just been very good um let's see okay um east Hockin road again an easy story mm -hmm. um what happened is the the land trust spent a lot of time trying to figure out um you know had the they had uh uh, done something very bold and and opened up a, a 20 22 car area 22 car parking area there yeah. and it had worked for a while for one year reasonably well and kept the the, the, the sort of safety corridor keep, kept people from parking on the road on uh, out front but then it started to become an attractive nuisance we found that people were camping there and stuff like that they decided you know it was which was in their right uh, that they weren't going to open that and that they were really not in the parking business and um, they, they're very clear about their thinking and we understand it. So uh, again, we looked at the, uh, we worked with Pete and the, and the uh, uh, police, uh, well, then uh, the, the police officers here to figure out what the uh, safe areas in terms of sight lines. We brought those back and we determined a new parking ordinance that was passed in March, very much alongside what we did with Dugway. Uh, made a press release, that same press release in May, put the signage out. And um, again, we didn't have a normal summer, but it is, it it seems to be working, but I think we need another uh, nice, hot, bright summer to know that. Now, one of the things that we are doing going next is that um, there is a portion of, of still legal parking that's uh, beyond the bridge and, and before the, the uh, intersection. Um, and during the uh, the roadside paving, it, it did it, it made the, the the off street parking a little bit more difficult? So um, I 
and John of leading this. He's exploring the cost benefit of restoring the roadside that was parked there. He's worked with Pete. You got your first estimates. And yeah, I'll, I'll quickly say that it, it really made it impossible to park in the places that were set aside unless you're in a serious four wheel drive vehicle. And it's very nice pavement now, but 4,000 was the estimate. We were going to talk over as a committee whether that would be a desirable thing for the town to do. Mm -hmm. Also, the Richmond Land Trust has discussed having a turnaround and handicapped parking on the Bombardier Meadow. Mm -hmm. And the last I heard, they might not get to that this year because they're so busy working on Gillette Pond, but that could be useful if it came to happen. Mm -hmm. And actually, Oh, we, I was going to say, speaking of the left one, because <laughs> that, that we also have the same kind of issue uh, up there about uh, the fill. Uh, but uh, one uh, that comes first is Edmonds uh, Bridge Parking. Uh, Pete actually put some lines. We had a, a, a parking area there, but since it wasn't marked, people would sort of park sideways and, and eliminate all the parking. But right just a couple there. of stripes in there, and that's been working really, nice. really well. Right, so. Just it's all toe the line. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's surprising how docile people can be. Uh, Gillette Pond, uh, very interesting, um, very interesting development. Uh, there were some parking concerns raised in February. It turns out there, there was some uh, um, discussion about uh, people being having getting tickets. There was a lot of rumor going on, and evidently there were there was really not much of an issue. However, it brought it into our focus, and, and uh, we were trying to figure out as the the land trust, um, uh, you know, goes through and, and rebuilds that bridge. They are actually putting some more parking in there, which is great. But we would expect, um, on a good winter at least, that we would actually need more parking. So a uh, resident, a uh, nearby resident, offered the idea of, of putting roadside parking along his property, um, which is. Pretty, you know, that's a really generous thing. We've got to figure out how does that work, and we've been in contact with Pete and the, the police officer, uh, you know, um, the Hinesburg police now, uh, Cambridge. And as you all know, the DAM project is on the DAM project, not the DAM N project, is on hold till spring of 2024 because that high water kept they they had problems uh, being able to go ahead with mm -hmm. this. So this is a bit also on hold, uh, but. What is not on hold is we want to discuss. We're going to coming up next. We're going to discuss with the resident and the land trust and the highway department, and eventually with all of you on the go ahead to actually uh, uh, do some fill on that landowner's land. And if we can, we're hoping to uh, if, uh, to sort of intercept some of the fill that comes out and actually oh, use, perfect. use it. But um, there's there's some timing and some permission and the quality of the work. And so again, Pete's been very helpful. And that's also, I think John mentioned, you know, we, we also got an estimate for that. Oh, around $4,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the main question there is just the logistics of when the fill, when the fill is coming out and what form that's in. Um, one other thing is that Overoffers Park um, continues to be lightly used, but it is getting used. Uh, we put new signage in in June and we had some great ideas about uh, an upgrade to that, including some signage. We met with the trails and recreation committees and had some great ideas, but then the, a couple of weeks after that, it was underwater. Uh, so that's all been delayed. Uh, so we are now gonna con reconsider some of those uh, uh, upgrades to uh, the parking area. And perhaps the trails, have been, uh, trails committee has considered whether there's a more direct route to the, uh, to the water. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a nice asset right now. Well, I'm, okay. so, I'm very glad you guys are, yeah. Um, over Rocker Park is that's like your personal hangout, right? Well, since uh, my foot episode, I can't do much walking, so I uh, frankly, I take a lacrosse stick down there, and so the ball for my dogs back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> then their tongues hang out, and we go home. But there, at least this time of year, there's rarely there's typically zero to one car there other than me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's sort of this sweet spot, it's big, empty parking lot, yeah. So we've got to figure out how to make it more inviting and 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 continue to you know uh, promote that it's there. We put some new signage in mm -hmm. uh, that would sort of rec people would recognize from yep. the road. But again, this summer was so wet. Right. Some of the feedback we had on that was was we put in river access signs because we were thinking mm -hmm. people were had no idea how close to the river they were. Some of the feedback we're getting is is people are a little worried about security and parking their car down there. 
because it is kind of tucked in out of the way and if there's 40 cars down there you're probably okay but if you're that lone car we've got to kind of figure out how we're going to address that there is a history of that like the gaps you know if you ever hike the top of the mountain ridge the app gap it's yeah yeah that little so, lot up there uh, yeah. cars are broken into their All routine because you know they're gone for two days they or even for three hours yeah. like a short hike up there is a couple hours so yeah yeah I still think it's a good asset, but we got to figure yeah, out how yeah. you know, it, was, it was just sort of a windfall because the town owned it. Yeah. So one uh, thought regarding that is to include the chief in the conversation about patrols. I mean, yeah. Cochrane Road gets more attention there, in the summertime. Here it comes. So, here it comes. Yeah. yeah, Chief Cambridge has been fantastic to work with. And he's uh, He has a, a, a good notion of, you know, uh, um, how he enforces the law you know, mm -hmm. in an appropriate way. He uses However, discretion. Yeah, he has discretion, and uh, but he's made it very clear that he needs a, a, he needs the law to sort of define what he can use discretion around. And and this is where we had feedback on overnight overnight parking. Our feedback is kind of um, it's restricted to what we think our purview is. So what we did is, uh, and thanks to Diane and, and Chuck particularly for really reading this Richmond Municipal Park Ordinance. And what we found out, that there were a couple of adjustments that need to be made there. Um, in section, if, if you read this thing, it's great bedside reading. Um, and there's a section called General, and specifically, it lists Browns Court Ball Field off Browns Court, Volunteers Green uh, off Bridge Street, and it does not list Overrocker because the, the mm -hmm. statute was written before Overrocker. So we suggest that the, this this wording is added, so then Overrocker is, is, and this is towards the conversation with this headboard about you know including that in there, mm -hmm. and then we go on further in section four, subsection B. There, bold is in that, that, that's just taking the bold from the actual document. No person shall, without written permission, secured in advance from the Richmond Administrative Office. Then the point one needs to be clarified. Um, so the, the original language uh, was, was didn't really point out that somebody might be there in a car or they might be using it for overnight use. So we suggest that the, the ordinance is changed um, to uh, set up, it reads, set up tents, campers, or any other temporary shelter. We would suggest that it should be reworded to set up tents, campers, vehicles, or any other temporary shelter with the intention of overnight use. And with that ordinance, then Chief Cambridge can use his discretion. You know, what we want to prevent is if somebody's really tired, they just can't drive anymore, and they're not causing a nuisance, it might, you know, up to him. And and uh, that's a, you know, we've and had he, complications. He was okay with them. Uh, no, he had not he seen, this. seen this yet. This is not proposed. So we didn't want to talk about it with anybody until we ran it by and, and I I personally was not signing on to this because I yeah. thought I heard from Chief Cambridge that he was okay mm -hmm. with the things well as they stood but the others disagreed yeah it, it's the, uh, okay and and we it, that which was good because we had a really healthy discussion on this um because there was no wording on overnight use that you know some of us felt that Chief Cambridge needed that in case he needed to enforce it, but I think we also feel that he uses the right discretion overall, and that it probably would be. Okay. There'll, okay. there'll be plenty of opportunity for public input if we have to change the ordinance. Yeah, yeah. there's a long. Problem. But here, yeah, but when we really <clears throat> discuss it, and there are the there there are the sort of practical issues because we've had problems in the town, but there there's other things, uh, other issues about unhomed people. <laughs> And what we felt is we really looked at our purview and beyond this clarity, we don't think it's our mission to make any specific re re uh, recommendations regarding time housed individuals. But we think that this, along with uh, you know, uh, uh, having the law enforcement have discretion, is a good step to take. Mm -hmm. And if something goes beyond that, yeah. So I, I'm, I appreciate pulling together the draft. Um, I think it probably is inappropriate for us to entertain this without Chief Cambridge in the room to discuss the content. One other question, though, when I think where I've actually seen people park for extended periods of time, I'm not sure they were all on your map. So one was the Willis Hill parking. Oh, good point. You know, um, so I'm just telling you where I've seen yeah. people park for days. That's one. 
Um, the other one, there is a lot by Southview. Yeah. It's a tiny spot. Near the water tank? Um, near the, the old, old yeah, water tank across the street from the new water tank. And then um, there's a spot near Faye's Corner where I saw somebody park for days as well. So interesting. We are the rec. Uh, just front, we are the recreation parking areas, and I think what one thing that you mentioned is that we we should probably look at Willis Hill because that is recreation parking. I'm it's calling that question on. sort of the scope, uh, and yes. I I don't have an opinion about what your scope should be, but it seems to me that one probably falls in. Volunteers Green is interesting because that's used for more than just recreation. Right. So I, you know, there's not a perfect answer. I've, like Occam's razor is it in or out? But but we can talk about Willis Hill on the other places. It's not know. recreational. I'm right. curious uh, whether any any of you have uh, sort of say it was an a, a interesting conversation, a very robust conversation. We really appreciated it. One thing went, one thing happened when we wanted to confirm the request to have uh, pack input on this was we were told to focus on recreational parking areas. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. roadside, <clears throat> not our world. You know, parking in front of Bridge Street. You know, we have we have owners of stores <laughs> yeah. at Bridge Street complain to us that people pull in, take their bikes off their cars, and go for a ride. That's recreational parking. Eh, yeah, yeah, kind of. So I mean, we so we didn't take this any further than I felt and we felt was our. Yeah. Was our the only gray our... area I think is Willis Hill because is that recreation or something that's else? I can argue. But is that, that is that that's, that's, uh, that's not a town owned. I don't think. I don't think. I think that, who owns that? Carl, well, I'm saying. going back to the other map. It is a land trust. So there's Beacon, which is not town. It's land trust. Land trust. I think um, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I don't think that everything here is necessarily town owned and managed. I, I think actually we oh, have it okay. on our map. Okay. No, we don't. That's Browns Court. I think. Oh, here it is. There, way it's right here. Yeah. And maybe we should, is we should start. I don't have an opinion. I just was, my wheels were turning about what have I seen? And I'm not saying it's your problem to solve. I just started to think about it. Gee. Well, so I think yeah. going back to the ordinance suggestion, and this is just our first float of this. And I think there's got to be a lot more discussion with Chief Cambridge. And of course, if you change the ordinance, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be put out there and warned. And so there's a lot more to do here. But, but these well, are our properties. That's, I think, I where don't, it's I don't think so. It might be. Yeah. I don't think that the town owns. Willis Hill parking or B. No, it's these three. These three are our parking. Yeah, oh, you're yeah. right. But, no, but yeah, I think right. but I think their map you're right. shows recreational parking. So it's two different things. Whether it's owned by the town or not, but you can park there for recreation because it's it's open yeah. for the public. The right. But yeah, we can't control Willis Hill in an ordinance, but we can control so over Rock. There, but we should probably still consider it from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um and then you know, Chief Cambridge might have enough discretion right now in these other Places and it, it probably fits for the particularly the uh, the off road probably fits more in the traffic ordinance than it does. Yeah, the park. You know, we're park not. Parking. Yeah, I think if, I think if we're we're looking at considering other parking areas that might fall under our, our umbrella, um, or at least fall under the ordinance. I think uh, the Andrews, the new Andrews town property there, that parking lot is certainly town. Yeah. And not listed right. as one of our areas, mm -hmm. so you may want to consider <laughs> right. adding that on. We can there. add that. That's okay. And, um, and, and the other one, I'm not sure. The Robbins Mountain parking area. No, that's a good question. That's that that is a map, map, but that's a, that's yeah. an, okay. So, oh, but, and, and same with the V trans one. We we really can't make a change over there right now. We're trying to get seasonal parking signs for there. There's a Jeff yeah, pointed out you work on the retrans. There's a there's an application process and there's a there's a hearing and, and you I just a, want to put a sign up. Can you get a bike lane as long as you're doing this on the <laughs> way. Sure. Why not? Um so that's really our discussion. And I think there's a lot of the town needs to have more thought on overall. And just in the end, we we this has been a, a real community effort. We just want to thank everybody. The well, land trust has been a great partner. Highway department, you know, Pete, like the sixth member of our team, select board, especially Lisa, who sits in on our meeting, town staff, you know, Josh and, and uh, Duncan have been fantastic, and the various police <laughs> police department. No, I mean, uh, Chief Con Cambridge uh, uh, is just really great mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and residents who have been very, very open and V-trans. So it's, it's been a fun thing. And, you know, we we're kind of curious if, uh, you have any uh, other than what we said up there? Anything else? 
No, I'm, I'm pleased as punch how much work you guys have put in because you, we all know what a big problem this was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And if we have a normal summer, you know, this will be the test. But I, I, I have hopes that it'll all work out well, especially for those of you who live down there near the uh, bridge who had to deal with the year 2020. Crazy. I like the approach where here's all the parking, some of which we don't manage. Just for the record, you could park there. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's one big picture and the narrower picture of what can we actually control in terms of policy or try to influence behavior. So I think that's an appropriate approach to take. And I think the question of, you know, is Andrew's community forest parking in or out is something you might entertain. Anyway, in terms of being on the map, it should be. Yeah, yeah. That, that has such a great committee that's already running it. We're not yeah. going to go in there and suddenly say, or you just parking committee, them. you know, and, yeah. but, yeah. but I think it should be included in municipal parking areas. One, one of the interesting things is some of these parking areas are not on Google Maps and you can mm. provide them. And for example, Overrockers mm. has been queried about 1500 times. Huh. So we, we can actually, we're hoping that when people see they can't park A, they can park B mm -hmm. and that they can find it. Mm -hmm. Diane, anything you want to add? Um, the only thing I, I would like to add is um, it might be great for us to entertain sometime a um, a commitment that maybe could be yearly between the Richmond Land Trust and the uh, Hinesburg Police Department so that they could actually stop into their properties. Um, you mentioned um, some of the ones, <clears throat> even any of their ones actually, they could have overnight parking and sometimes the patrols might see somebody there, but they're not going to stop in. They only stop in uh, because it's private property at the request of somebody on the Richmond Land Trust. But I think it would be really helpful if you're noticing some of their properties having overnight camping or and for whatever, whatever reason. It might be good to make that bond between them to say, yeah, go ahead and check our stuff out too. I'm just going to observe, having talked about that in the past, that from my memory is legally fraught mm -hmm. when when does a public sector entity uh, enforce private sector rights yeah and good point on a sensitive issue and it, again it's a conversation to have with chief cambridge who's far more informed on this than i am mm -hmm. um but i'll remind people of the history of police in the united states which to a large degree started with people chasing slaves in the southern part of the country mm -hmm. Um, where, in fact, that's how they started. It was public police and sheriffs protecting private slave owner rights. And so I think we should be properly cautious about the relationship between a public sector police department and private landowners. I don't know what it is, but that's I defer to the chief on that. I wonder if the correct route on that is to take us out of the equation entirely and have the land trust speak directly to uh, Chief Cambridge, as if you were had the 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 Essex Fairgrounds or someplace like that, where you tell the police feel free yeah. to patrol there. Yeah. Very similar situation. Let's get us out of this and have the land trust talk to Chief Cambridge directly. And okay. I can say, in some areas, like the during fair time, my understanding is fair time they pay the police to show up and police the area. So they are at that point they're contracted employees. Mm -hmm. But there was a hand raised back here too. Yeah, just just a quick. Uh, this is specific. Keith O'Warren, our planning director. Um, this is specific to Gillette Pond. If you're going to do any grading on private property, get that in front of the zoning administrator. Get his eyes on it uh, to make sure you don't need to go to the DRB. And if you need to go to the DRB, I'm sure it'll be approved. I think that's an issue. But that's just process. That's all. You're welcome. Thank you. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you to all. Thank you, thank Diane, you. and thank those of you here in person. And we will. Be talking to you. Nice job, guys. Yeah, this is awesome. Oh, June. For actually, June was it. asked. Go ahead, June. Yeah, I just want to reiterate this. I've said this before, but I really appreciate the fact that this committee has brought it forward about overnight housing because I think this is not just um, you know people are looking at this as an issue with unhoused. It is not. It is an issue of public health because if anyone is parking for you know because they just want to camp for a couple of days in this beautiful town. Um, it's a public health issue because there are no restrooms available. You know, we, the gentleman that was parking up by uh, off of um, on Jericho road, that, that 
seemed like a safety issue and be, and then became a safety issue. But it's, you know, the, the chief, chief Cambridge has said like he could take care of it one, one, you know, issue at a time, but he made it clear to me that he could do nothing about that guy parked there because he wasn't breaking the law. And so if we do not have anything that says, you know, you cannot park o- overnight without permission, you're opening yourself up to p- public health and public safety issues. So I just want to continue to put that out there because I know that that the chief has said like, well, let's look at it one, you know, one situation at a time, but he could not do anything until that person threatened someone. And so it just doesn't make sense to me that we're going to wait until there's a crisis to figure out a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. So our next item on the agenda um, relates to our community wellness item on the budget. We have an organization called All Together Now. Stephanie Hartsfield is here from All Together Now. Um, and we have $5,000 in our budget for community wellness. Nothing has been spent toward that line item so far this year. Um, the request before us tonight is to approve up to $3,000 from that budget line to pay for work that's already taking place by All Together Now. Um, we, our general rule of thumb is you ask for the money before you do the work, but Stephanie and Josh have talked about that, and she understands that going forward, um, the request should come first. But Stephanie is here tonight to talk to us about what would what this money would be has been used would would be used to pay for, and anything else about altogether now she wants to share. So Stephanie, I I think the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and I also want to mention that Zoe Bernstein is here, one of our youth interns. So I just uh, want to thank everyone for their grace and support both over the years and in this particular funding cycle, because I did mess up the process. Um, Josh and I talked about it. it's been um, quite a journey since July of this year. So I know that I should request the funding before it's spent. But this funding, as in previous years, Richmond's been very generous in our request for support in stipending youth interns for um mental health supports for youth in the area and creating a prevention coalition um, for the five town area. So we request funds from uh, Richmond and we've now gotten funds from some of the other towns and our community, the well-being resource directory is up on four of the five towns. And I will put um, a link in the chat. We just received our first, um, well, our second round of funding, second or third, but this is the real one. We got $25,000 from uh, the United Way as a prevention lead organization. So we can finally hire um, a program manager. So we're very excited and we couldn't have done it without Richmond and some of the other town supports that yes, we've been working towards for a really long time. And really all the work has come from the youth. They've done everything, the website, the program design, um, and just really everything. I just want to turn over to Zoe for a minute. Um, Zoe, do you want to maybe just tell them why you do this or even about the current project you're working on with some UVM students? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Bernstein. Um, I live in between Jericho and Richmond, and I'm a current senior at Mount Mansfield Union High School. And I started working with All Together Now in June of this past year. So it's been just about six months because I noticed at MMU there were students and I noticed specifically girls who were being overlooked and undervalued both by their peers and by their teachers. And I really work with all together now. Um, many people have their own aspects that they focus on and I am focusing on women's health. So right now I'm working with three lovely uh, UVM nursing students. Um, to create a research program for them and a project for me. We're gathering data on um, the education of teenage girls and kind of how gender relates to mentor, mental and physical health. And then that information is going to be used to create a uh, women's uh, young women's like meeting group. So every few weeks meet a discussion group, supports for each other, um, a collection of resources specifically for teenage girls and young women. And I'm really, really happy to be doing that and proud of the work we're doing. I cannot support all together now more. Thank you. 
Zoe. Yeah. And that, the rest of the updates I put in, in the document, we're happy. Zoe and I can answer any questions you have. Um, yeah, that's it. Questions from the board about all together now. Jeff. Um, I had a couple of questions. So uh, uh, what other towns are you working with and um, and how much are they contributing? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Bolton this year gave a thousand dollars or they have a, yeah, I guess it's the, it might be in next fiscal year's budget. Um, I have to double check on that. So Bolton gave a thousand. Jericho um, is planning on three thousand, but we missed the the debt. Like we were on the schedule for next fiscal year um, for three thousand as well. And then I think the timing got a little bit messed up with meeting attendance, so that might not show up in FY twenty five. It might not be till FY twenty six. Um, Bolton also has a select board member on our uh, board of directors. And then Huntington, we have gone back and forth. I think their request is at 2,500 and we're waiting on the approval. I think they're also doing it at town meeting day. So I'm not sure on that one. And Underhill, <laughs> we haven't um, made contact. I think we need, we now, oh, one of our new interns might have some contact with Underhill, but um, that's Underhill's kind of TBD, just to be honest. So are you expecting annual appropriations from each town? Did we do that? Did we do that for this program? I don't so know. you have a line in the budget, I think this is the second year we've had it, right. called Community Wellbeing or yeah. Community Wellness. Um, it's not earmarked specifically for all together now, but they're the only organization that's actually requested funding from that line. Um, so. Yeah. Um, and Thanks, you... Josh. I should have explained. Yeah, and actually the other towns, when they heard that um, kind of funding methodology, they they really like that. So it's different than the traditional nonprofit because it really is open for anyone to use. We don't, uh, yeah, we we like that it's community well-being as part of a lot of the town plans and resiliency. And so it really is there for anyone to use. Um, so we lo love that it sits there in that way um, for anyone to request funds for. Okay, and, and do you... Um, um... It, it, like, how do you tell how many people you serve from each town? It, or can you? Do... The data we gave to you in that report, we kind of, um, we based that on a survey that we did it last March, and we're going to repeat it this mar March. So we, we looked at the number of recipients to so the survey, and then we also can do look at kind of the percentages in high school. So the really this one that I gave you is based on um, the survey respondents from last March. And then when we do data collection, like Zoe's about to launch a survey on women's health and that'll go out right now. We focus mostly on um, the high school students. We want to expand to middle school, but we are just trying to get our feet underneath us first. Um, so when we do the survey data, we ask what town they're in. We ask for age bands and then what town they live in. So uh, I think, in future surveys, we'll have much more discrete data on which town they're in, so you can see what percentage is actually, go, you know, impacting which youth. Huntington's been very specific about wanting to make sure that it is impacting Huntington youth. The other thing I want to say is that we've um, tried to make sure we have a kids and board members representing a diversity of the towns. I don't think you included how many respondents um, up to these surveys you had. No, I didn't give you all the details. I think we have given them to you in earlier reports, but I'm happy to give you a link to the um, full data summary. I just usually it's kind of a short time frame to review all the data, but I can give you a link that shows all of it. Those are just a couple snapshots of different things because I know you have a lot in your packets to look at. You know, I can say um, that um, uh, one of the challenges that we've had with, you know, Howard Mental Health is uh, providing information about what kind of services they provide for Richmond. You know, they've given us general generalizations about for the county um, and uh, asked for a, a, you know, a, a sizable appropriation. But they, they haven't, to date that I know of, I don't, I don't think they've given us any data about it. Something on that? You know, something on that. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing that's it's of interest to, you know, probably any town, 
you know, and that kind of information. Yeah, I think Jeff, I think that's a really good point. And what I would say is um what this still counts in that mental health range. What I would say is um we are definitely focused on the prevention side of things. So this is considered a base layer to try and help create that protective layer before things get bad. So we are not like crisis services. We're not replacing anything that the Howard Center does because those things all work really well, and that's some of the data. But this data is part of that whole mental health spectrum of services. So we can continue to provide data, and I think that's actually a great request. Um, I would love to say, like, we want to come back in March or early April after we do the next survey and with the results of the survey that Zoe and the group of UVM interns put out. That will have some data in it as well. And some of the data I'm showing you, we have the well-being resource directory, and it is on four of the five towns um uh websites sorry i lost my train of thought websites and we can pull data around what type of resources people are using that for and what they're asking and so that's something where i can pull that maybe on a quarterly basis or not me like it'll be our program manager and say people are really that's one of the charts in there but it's a that's old um so they're most frequently looking for food internships or they're looking for mental health resources so that actually we can give you very concrete data um and where are they looking for it oh Zoe, you want to add something add a note um i don't know who spoke before about the numbers of people altogether now serves um that might have been you mr forward um um but i wanted to tell you so the survey that was done in march of last year reached almost every single MMU student. That's over 700 people. And okay. this, sur this survey that is being done this week will hopefully, um, we do it through technology, an app that everyone at MMU has automatically installed on their computers called Schoology. And you can post things to the whole school, the principal can. So our principal, Mr. Weston, will hopefully post this link and um, Mr. Weston, and this will be a survey to all the girls in the school, which is about 400 people. That's fantastic. Um, I, I, I will point out on one of your charts on the top challenges, um, mental health, I would expect, it's depressing, but I would expect that, that larger number, safety and defense, I can see that, and that's a great concern. Number three is food insecurity, is food. Um, and that one surprised me and alarmed me. Um, you know, not that the others don't, but that's a big chunk if it's, yeah. you know, if it's everybody, you know. So I thought that was interesting. Okay. Um, just uh, an aside, um, the Howard Center was mentioned. I have been emailing them, trying to get them to give me numbers. Oh, good. Um, and there seems to be, as this guy said in the movie, failure to communicate okay. because they they have a letter that they send out each year saying, here are the things we do. Doesn't list numbers, doesn't list how many Richmond um, residents were touched by these programs. And I say, well, we're looking for numbers. And they say, oh, well, we sent this letter. We're like, thanks. Can we have the numbers, please? Um, because I'm sure we're going to get asked about it at town meeting. And I'm deservedly so. And I'm going to get numbers if I have to go out there myself. But right now I'm talking to their director of development communications, and she understands we're looking for actual numbers. I will observe that that's also a question on our social appropriations mm -hmm. form, um, because it is a common occurrence. So the questions here, Stephanie, Zoe, are not unique to this. We are routinely, we routinely ask funded entities to tell us how many citizens of Richmond are served, and we are routinely asked that during town meeting and random select board meeting. So it's a sort of common baseline question. If the town is investing in X, how many people from our town are served by X? Right. Well, that's a good uh, reminder for us. So I'll make sure, um, cause I was thinking last, mm, I don't know. I know in 2020, we had some um, tables at town meeting day. And then since then the world turned upside down, but I definitely before this meeting day, this town meeting day, 
we can give you some reports with some really good data. So if you are asked, um, and because this does fall into uh, that mental health kind of wheel, um, we'll actually, we need to get it to all the towns, but we'll give you some data that at le least give you talking points around this specific metric. And this is technically a prevention coalition, which we haven't had before. So I think this is a nice feature um, and, and hopefully that'll help in one aspect. Super cool. Okay. There is a motion in the packet um, if anyone would like to make it or. Yes. So this is relative to um, this line item that we have on community well being and our uh, at fiscal 24 budget. Um, I move to approve the use of up to $3,000 from the community well being budget line to pay for work completed by All Together Now. Ms. Bard, I will second that. And we have a motion from Jeff Ford, seconded by Bard Hill, to move to approve the use of up to $3,000 from the community well-being budget line to pay for work completed by Altogether Now. Is there any further discussion? I will point out that we have $5,000 in that line item that hasn't been spent, spent to date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, please state your name and your vote. It's Jeff, aye. Bard, aye. David, aye. Mason, aye. And Jay, hi. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Zoe. Zoe, thank you in particular. It's great to see our next generation stepping up and doing the things that apparently we are not always willing to do. I appreciate it. And if you need a young person or want a young person to speak at town meeting day about this uh, women's program, I would be more than happy to. I believe Stephanie could give you my email. Nice. Okay. Under, under business, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you all. Our next item um, has to do with the Little League field standard volunteer screen. You want to do that? Sure. Um, so we discussed this at the end of uh, December about repairing the Little League fields that lost a lot of clay during the flood and also had some clay pushed up by the grass areas where it shouldn't be. Um, did have a conversation with FEMA uh, in December about them covering it. Typically, they don't cover things that the town hasn't maintained, and Little League has been maintaining those fields. Uh, but the conversation with the representative at FEMA said, well, if Little League went away, the town would have to maintain these fields. So she thought it would be an improved expense. So proceeded to do an RFP for the, the maintenance of this project. Um, what we'll need to do is get um, probably two loads of clay per field to, to replace what was lost. Field one is in the worst shape. It had some pretty big rivets actually kind of like channeled out mm -hmm. that's been filled with stone. Pete did that as a temporary repair to make sure no one twisted an ankle. Remove that stone, replace clay. Uh, fields two and three, which are the next two in, uh, need more clay, but also need clay removed from the grass areas where it's folded over and it shouldn't be, and then some topsoil replaced there. Um, went out to bid, sent it out to local contractors, lots of uh, landscapers, as well as excavators. Unfortunately, we only received one bid back, but um, it does qualify our procedure for uh, Procurement, the bid we did get was from a company down in the Hartsfield, Vermont area, and they do a lot of baseball fields. I reached out to them directly. I saw the look on your face, like, how did they get that, that bid? <laughs> um, but in, in uh, talking to some of my baseball contacts, um, I talked to a person who runs Little League in um, Woodstock, and they came up and renovated one of their fields, like, really, really well. We're not getting that service because we we're, we're, we're kind of replacing clay. But I think we'll be getting a contractor that's going to be paying a lot of attention to the fields, really understanding how they should be put back together um, and, and really knows what they're doing. Um, so the bid that they put in was for $19,140. Um, there are some timing issues where they get, obviously they get very busy right when the weather breaks. So they get a lot of fields to maintain. But we talked with him and with Pete about having them come up. Um, you know, as soon as the weather is available to kind of triage, get the most important stuff done, and then come back later, even if it's in the middle of the baseball season, to, to work on the on the clay spreading. We will still need to purchase clay. Um, just a quick update on that. The type of clay that's been used in the fields comes from Hattica Stone out of the Castleton, New York area. And I sort of queried and looked around to see is there any other vendors. And the general consensus I got back was that for that quality of material, they're the only vendor in the area that provides that. So we'll likely be a single source vendor for that just to kind of continue with the same quality, uh, which will be an additional probably 17500 or so. Any questions? Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion? 
Jay, this is David. I move to approve entering into an agreement with Valley Turn Services LLC to repair damage done to the three baseball fields in the July 2023 flooding for an amount not to exceed $19,140. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from David Sanders, seconded by Lisa Miller, to approve enter to move to approve entering to an agreement with Valley Turn Services LLC to repair damage done to the three baseball fields in the July 2023 flooding for an amount not to exceed nineteen thousand one hundred forty dollars. Any further discussion? Please state your name and your vote. Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Okay, our next item um, has to do with town meeting and discussion of Australian ballot questions. Um, Jeff and Josh asked the town attorney if it would be permissible to present information on and discuss Australian ballot items at town meeting, such as the uh, town center bond vote and the conservation reserve fund. Our attorney advised us that this is possible as long as the presentations are based on facts and do not ask people to vote yes or no. He advised against setting up a table or handing out any printed information on these items at town meeting. Um, Thus, the question is, do we want to use this approach for the bond vote and for the Conservation Reserve Fund? So um, uh, the uh, the Town Center Committee is cognizant of uh, this question of whether uh, of, of presenting facts rather than opinions about this. And, and um, I feel that we've been very careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we intend to continue to do that. Um, uh, I, I feel it would be really useful and important, actually, to be able to um, uh, give at least a, 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 a portion of our presentation um, to what will, is undoubtedly our lar largest public hearing of the year. Um, so um, I would very much like to uh, do a presentation, as I'm sure the, the uh, Conservation Commission would like to for... Uh, uh, for that ballot item as well. I don't see a conflict. Yeah, Jeff, I would agree. I have noted that you've bent over backwards to avoid the hard sell to people mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. You know, you don't want to make people feel like you're pulling a fast one, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done a very good job giving a factual basis and the tours, I mean, it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So I would be in favor of you doing a presentation. Um, Lisa mm -hmm. says likewise. Mm -hmm. David or Bard, any opinion? I was going back and forth between handouts and presentations. My only thought on presentations, then, would we entertain presentations from others, like anybody else? Um, these are for specifically for items that are on the uh, on the ballot. We were told actually that we cannot give handouts, which is odd. But it, this is not, you know, it's not without precedent either. Um, and, you know, many other. This is, I think it's new that we asked. Um, you know, yeah. that, that uh, had previously, uh, uh, there, my recollection is 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a statutory change of some fashion. Um, and, and now, and it might have been because of COVID and mm -hmm. Zoom and all of that. Um, but so let's think of the scope. So the scope, we do the budget the night before. Well, we do the budget the day of. The day of now, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's all gonna. It's gonna be a long meeting. So we do the budget. We could do town uh, center building. The conservation commission could well, do one. Well, yep. Is there anybody else? The other ones are There's, on the floor, but yeah. Well, there's the housing the appropriations. Thing. Well, all the social mm -hmm. items. That'll be a discussion. Those are yeah. Mm -hmm. But are they a presentation? Well, they're not Australian ballot items, so... So that's where I'm going, though, is we should be clear about the scope that we're talking about. Right. Um, so we're not looking for presentations from every organization that's on the town meeting agenda for a vote. This would be specific to the town center building and potentially conservation commission in addition to the budget. I just want to be clear on what... Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Point. Yeah, we'll make a day of it. Well, the senior center is going to be selling food, right? My guess is it'll go beyond lunch. <laughs> I, guess, I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it sounds like we're okay with the presentations taking place. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, conservation, no. And yeah. 
Clint as well. <laughs> Try to keep it short. Okay. Um, should we establish an expected time limit? I say this thoughtfully because I just came last week was part of a meeting, a regional meeting, and I was told I'm chairing this meeting, oh, these people are supposed to give 10 minute presentations. The first one is hitting minute 20 and I'm texting <laughs> them going, but they know it's supposed to be 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I think we might contemplate while the questions and answers could go longer, we might contemplate a time limit to a presentation because they have a tendency to yeah. expand. You know, I can get a big box. Are you about implying that I would expand the conversation? <laughs> Jeff, I guarantee you my budget presentation will be longer than your presentation. Yeah. When I was in Toastmasters years ago, we had always a box in the back there with a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. Yeah. And if you're doing a five to seven minute speech, the green one went on at five, the yellow one went at six, the red one went on at seven, yeah. and you that you were you sat down. Oh, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't do that for me. So we could get one. We could get one of those easy. We could at least like say you know try and keep like our the intent is like ten minutes or less, mm -hmm. even for the budget, except for the budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we get the sense though. We don't want to. We're not going to make any friends making a lengthy presentation. Yes. I've never, I've never heard of this show. Stay, 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 met to say, how do we think the shared services are going and what do we want to do next? And everybody was very positive on both sides mm -hmm. that they thought it was working well. Todd Odit made a, a think, I think a very good point that it's hard for them to budget since they're the ones paying for this and we're reimbursing them if they don't have cost certainty of knowing that we're not going to at the end of the year just say buy and there they are with budgeted services. Um, and so we tentatively mentioned well, do we want to do more than one year? Would a four-year contract be better? And nothing was set in stone. We just agreed to meet again. And so um, the item on our agenda tonight is to discuss shall we meet again and and do we want to start the ball rolling on getting that scheduled? And any other comments people may have on this topic? And we would also mention their their public safety study is out and out correct. public. Their public safety study is out. It's it's public. Yeah, it was discussed in their select board meeting a couple of weeks ago. The it's September on their website. study is now available. Yes. As of January 15th. Awesome. No, and I'm not being glib because yeah. like I was aware it was almost here, almost here for a while. So that was a milestone. So I think the conversations include not only a duration of an agreement, but an intended end state. Mm -hmm. So are we looking to consider ongoing just contractual relationships? And we also have an item that's relevant later in executive session about a collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. with the union representing Richmond officers. So we have chief services, we have officer services, we have administrative support services as three areas. Mm -hmm. And are we talking contracting forever or contracting for a while and contemplate a new municipal district, essentially a new joint police force, the regionalization that people have talked about in the past. I'm not clear because we then should have that conversation. And embedded in that, we've had conversations in the past, should we have like a, a third party independent facilitator, especially if we're going down that more ambitious path towards integration, somebody that might independently lead the two groups towards fruition. And so I think those are all things that we could talk about in that meeting, like what's our short term, what's our medium term, what's our long term, mm -hmm. and, and how do we get there? I will also say I am cautious about four-year commitments because we have budgets for the next four years. Right. That was just a number tossed yeah. out. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, we'd say, yeah, we're open to it, but it really, it, each year it's dependent on the budget. So it would have a caveat. At, right. Those other things that you talk, just talked about could occur before. That That's occurred. right. For what it's worth, real quick, um, about the the survey being public, for those watching at home going, what is this survey, I'm this this study? This is the town of Heinsberg's website, um, just heinsberg.org. And if you scroll just a little bit, you'll notice that 
Um, the public safety strategic plan, the link is right here. And when you go to it, it um, comes up with a watermark of draft still stamped on it. But um, this is what they're circulating. OK, Jeff. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is one of the last things that uh, Bard has said about having a third party uh, facilitator. Um, I can see that one of the challenges might be in this two town committee is like who's in charge, mm -hmm. you know, who's the chair, you know, who calls the meeting, who sets the agenda. Uh, and uh, frankly, I wouldn't want either town doing that mm -hmm. because it, it it creates an imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I actually did some research on this. I I, uh, I, I called the commissioner of public safety. Um, she commended us for for going down this path, and I uh, said that terrific. Do you have any kind of resources to help us to do this? And she goes, resources? Like what do you mean by resources? Well, how, how about money? No, of course not. You know. Um, <laughs> And not, you know, and, and uh, you know, I said, what about staffing? And she goes, well, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. I mean, she has it. Um, I also talked to Ted Brady. He's the um, executive director of VLCT about it. He says, great, really encourage everybody you talk to encourages us to go down this road. And, mm -hmm. I, and you know, I asked, do you have any resources to help us do that? And he talked about Trevor Whipple and Trevor Whipple has been very helpful with advice, but he doesn't have capacity to do this. And then I started thinking about it's not really technical expertise that we need, it's more facilitation expertise. It, the, the topic, the, the details of policing are not as necessary as trying to formulate how the two towns work together. You know? Vermont hasn't done this as far as I know. Correct, they have so not. So where in Vermont are we gonna find something that expertise? Okay, so I have, I, I actually, I talked to Paul Costello. Um, he used to be the executive director of um, uh, Vermont Council on Rural Development, um, mm -hmm. uh, which has a lot of experience uh, dealing with rural communities on a variety of issues. Um, and he's recently retired, and I kind of explained the situation. Uh, at first, he kind of, you know, and I asked him if he had any capacity for it, because in, in, in some ways, this is an, an, in, is a, an interesting consulting task, because it could be time limited. It's a yeah. specific task that's time limited, at least for this year, of trying to work through that. Mm -hmm. And so what he did, first he hedged on it, and then he said, well, this is actually pretty interesting. And he gave me a one-page proposal. Uh, I didn't get it until this weekend, so I didn't, didn't try to include it in the packet. I do have copies of it, but I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, it may be premature giving it to you now. I don't know. But I wanted to let you know that um, when I read through it, you know, he has three meetings that he proposes of, of what, identifying what the issues are, um, testing the visions of, of uh, each of the, the uh, municipalities uh, and re uh, reviewing and improving and, and coming up with a, um, a response. So to me, the, the proposal looked pretty good. And um, uh, what I would suggest I can do is I can share it with you and you could bring it to that next meeting. Anything that we do, it costs money relative to this. Mm -hmm. The meat has to be split 50-50, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and there has to be buy-in from both sides. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a place to go. Sure. So one additional comment I'd make, I, I think I told you this some weeks ago, maybe months ago now, Jay, that I also reached out to Charlie Baker, Regional yep. Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because they had worked on this re regionalization of uh, dispatch mm -hmm. that is sort of foundered. At the That's moment. one way to put it. <laughs> Another way is it's right next door to the Titanic. <laughs> but they they put a lot of time and effort. There was time and money and stuff spent on that. And they just, he does not currently have the bandwidth. They do not currently have the bandwidth. So I was looking for something kind of free or cheap or cost shared with mm -hmm. other money, but that was ought for naught. So this was not offered as free? You know, even as retired people, their time is worth money. Right. Um, he, he gave me a, a you know, a, a throw out budget of $150 an hour and the process might take up to 30 hours. Uh, that seemed like a worthwhile expense to me, particularly if it was split between two towns. I would agree, John, Jeff. Um, when we actually had that meeting, it was here in our building and I and, and merely their chair is sitting right here. And I'm waiting for them to say, well, we think, and it's just the whole time with Sure, Jay, whatever. 
you know, you can run things. You're doing a good job. I'm like, please argue with me. Yeah. <laughs> if I, to work with, yeah. yeah, give me something to work with. Mm -hmm. So I think having somebody who, who, who has some experience with this kind of thing is better than J people just going, sure, Jay, whatever. Because so, I'm not an expert. What if we had this sort of in our pocket and bro broached the subject at a future meeting mm -hmm. in Heinsberg and said, we think this might make sense. Here's mm -hmm. one idea. Um, and they no. would have to agree on both the budget and the direction yeah. and the value, in fact. Are mm -hmm. they interested? Tell us about this guy. I mean, a lot. You okay. know? Yeah, he, he's fantastic. He's a known guy. He's fantastic. <laughs> he, he, he was the executive uh, director for real. decades. He knows the guy. He's, he's really better. something. Um, but, you know, I don't know him as a friend. This is not, I'm not trying to, right. uh, you, know, uh, you know, give a contract to somebody that I know. Mm -hmm. It's just somebody that I know who is very competent in this in this respect yeah i just i'm trying to visualize the process playing out and there's there's bound to be contentious issues there has to know, be. Yeah. and they can be settled but they're, they're easier to settle when they're focused and not and facilitate mediate it seems to mm -hmm. me you know it's kind of what, what what i'm thinking so what i can do is i can give you um uh you know copies of thank you this proposal you can look it over i'll send it electronically to josh so we can mm -hmm. post it this is not intended to be secret it's just it, it uh, you know i got it over the weekend you know, I, I i worked on this last week sort of a stake in the ground yeah. like if we wanted here's one example and i think it would you know i mean you think about how how many times have you met now this committee Maybe like two or three june i just want to say that if if this is the road you're going to go down i do think you should put it out for proposal because i do think there are um former police officers uh, and state troopers who have done some of this work. And so I think you're going to want to put a proposal out, particularly because of the amount, even if it's $150 at 30 hours, um, that's close to $5,000. And June, you would not personally be interested in bidding on this? I don't know if I would be. I might be. Okay, just checking. <laughs> uh, but it's not my forte. I'll say that. <laughs> okay. So any Point. further discussion on this, people? Okay. So um, before, it, 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 so in order to get there, to put it out for an RFP, I think you need to talk about it with, uh, you know, Heisberg as well. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe just close the loop by saying, what are the next steps on scheduling the next meeting with Heisberg? Um, I'll send out an email to the team with the doodle poll, and we'll try to find a time to get together. And then I'll send out a sample agenda too, so we can, which is kind of your three things here, and see if they have any feedback so we can get the agenda together. And just to be clear for everyone who hasn't been following the through sequential meetings, one of the things we said is kind of put a lot of this conversation on hold until we saw the final report. Mm -hmm. And now the final report from Heinsberg is out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next time on the agenda, um, we saved the best for second to last. Mm -hmm. Um, is our planning and zoning update from our legendary planning and zoning director, Keith Oakborn, who is here with us tonight. Hello, all. Hi. Hey, thanks for no business approach. sticking around. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> We're actually um, going pretty quickly tonight. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I know. So I figured I'd take about, I don't know, an hour right now, if that's right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We got Here's time. 11. I guess basically, you know, I give this to you every month. Um, I think you can expect me to be at some of these meetings, especially if there's an anticipation of some contentious issues, just as a relief valve. Mm -hmm. um, I can answer some questions and, we, you know, hopefully you can move the meeting along. Um, I'd like to do that on the first meeting of every month, if that's okay. Um, and it's and I have the bandwidth for it, too. I think that has a lot to do with it. But I guess uh, I'll submit the uh, report and just... Since I was here, regardless, I stuck around and just wanted to know if anybody had any questions. Um, you know, you, you literally have the horse's mouth right here. Okay, for those of you watching at home, um, the document that Keith is referring to is on the town website. It should be under the select board section, but also I'm assuming under the planning and zoning department on the town website. Um, Josh is sharing it right now, I believe. And are there any high points you want to call out for our friends? Uh, near and far? Well, I guess, I mean, the, the, the comments that are in bold are um, the newer ones. The ones that are not in bold are recycled as it states up top. Um, and this is a general format I've been following for the last few months. 
Um, these are, there is a bias here there, to a certain extent. Um, and these are uh, uh, opinions also, but they're based on, on my research and facts. But um, I do want to impart that I'm here to answer any questions from the public. Uh, stop in the office, shoot me an email. Um, housing is the touchstone of everything uh, in our department at this point. Mm -hmm. um, if it's uh, us permitting it, or if it's if it's myself moving the the planning commission forward with with Virginia's under Virginia's uh, tutelage, there, the housing committee is is beginning to really start to coalesce on this issue, mm -hmm. and I would I hopefully we'll be able to direct them towards more of an educational approach to to that based on facts um and uh you know we're, we, we have a little bit of, of interaction with ccrcp at this point um uh, the trans commit transportation committees on autopilot basically um you know they they're, they're just i mean they're solid they really are planning commission's pretty solid too uh, the, uh, uh, and again, as I was alluded to, the Housing Commission is starting to coalesce around a, a mission more than anything, which, is, which should be lauded at this point. So that's all I got. I do have a question. It has to do with the uh, bottom of that page there um, regarding buttermilk. Yes. Um, some time back, buttermilk came to us and said that they wanted to significantly increase the number of units um, and offered in return um, 10 units that would be affordable for 10 years. And we thought, hmm. And the number of units that they were proposing putting in, we felt would kind of necessitate having an egress, a secondary egress through the town center parking lot. Yeah. What's going on with that? Are they That's, still trying to? It's dead in the water. I mean, that, that physically cannot happen. Um, what I would like to see um, with that would be some type of crash gate or lockbox or something for, for emergency personnel to access that. You do need to, you really need two accesses in there, but not necessarily for, for the public. Uh, but certainly for, for emergency vehicles. So two follow-up questions. The first one is sort of technical. <clears throat> the affordable at 80% area median income, if I recall correctly, household area median income is about $82,000. Is that uh, about right? Somewhere around there. I, I, I'm not exactly sure exactly what it is. You know, uh, it, but you, you have to understand that that also includes utilities. That includes, I mean, it's the whole shebang. Um, not just not just so, a mortgage or or a rent. Yeah, income. and that the that's household income. That's correct. Median household size is two point three people. Yeah. So if we're saying that the studio units are affordable for that household of two point three people, mm -hmm. that strikes me as somewhat potentially problematic. Well, there is a scale that that is utilized, um, and there is one specific for. Um, you know, one bedroom studio or just studios and, and, it, and it goes up and it actually blows me away how much a studio could potentially go for $1,200, $1,400, somewhere around there like a month for a studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's what they're charging here. Um, so um, with that, there is that sliding scale based on the size. And so that's the question, I, you know, when I see like some units I'm interested in, like how many units and how big are they right. or what size? Because I think sort of accountability, transparency matters. Mm -hmm. um, so 80%, if it's affordable for which households and is it house, have they paid attention to the household size for the area median income as well? Yeah. And I, I realize this is a specialty of housers, like, but right. it is sort of what they talk about. Yeah, so that's one point. And this is, I mean, this is all open for discussion. You know, at this point, as I noted in my, in my notes here, that we're at an inflection point with that. Yeah. And it's 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 go time. Um, and uh, I don't have a bias towards this either way. Obviously, I want to see workforce housing. I want to see yeah. housing increase. But I'm not, we're not going to give the farm away on this. There, there, there's no way. And but I want to get to the point where we are right now, which is inflection, and move this forward through a quid quo quo approach. Makes sense. The other thing that we have heard. If I were going to stack all the things I've heard about on my in the select board uh, seat here over 10-ish years, one of the higher ranking ones is actually the intersection there by the market yep. and Jelena Court. And I think we should also be conscious about what people have said to us already about the problems with that intersection and what our approach might be into the future. Yep. Not that it's all 
um, buttermilk's problem to solve, but it's right. my ob ob observation that it's partially their problem to solve. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just another one that crosses my mind and I've heard about. And then I know there is a group of some size in town that's very thoughtful about flora and fauna and floodplain, floodway, Ooh. and that whole section. So for people who haven't been involved in the buttermilk discussions, you just think, oh, it's a bunch of land over there, whatever, what's the problem? But there are these like sort of guardrails or hurdles, I guess. Oh, there's a lot of limitations there. I mean, the floodplain, you know, I mean, you, you're, you're also dealing with the geology there too, from a construction point of view. You know, it'll be blasting there when they put in the, the second unit, no doubt. So, so those are just random comments based on stuff that we. Yep. Yeah, we're all cognizant about. about that. I know the, the planning commission's looking. We're looking into that. Um, not looking into that. We're cognizant of it at this point. Yeah. I want to get to the point where we start looking into it. So. Yeah. Um, have you put any? So we have an article on the town on the warning uh, that talks specifically about housing yep. at Browns Court. At Browns Court, right? Um, and um, it undoubtedly will bring up other issues as well, you know, relative to housing. Um, have you thought about, you know, what role the housing committee or, you know, the, you know, or you would have in facilitate facilitating a discussion about housing in Richmond relative to any of those? Specifically at the meeting or moving forward? Specifically or at both, the even. Um, yeah, um, uh, I think we're formulating that now. We had a special meeting on the 31st because we didn't have a quorum. On the on the first meeting, but we we met for the second meeting, and that was the focus. And that they're working through right now, and that'll be a flyer. I think that they're the ones that that will will be leading heavily on to uh, formulate that flyer and to to present or facilitate a conversation on that. But I, it, it's really important that this is that there is no bias in this. That this is a factual based conversation, mm -hmm. and um, you know that we move forward on on that vein. So, so and, and I think facts would be really useful, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know, like what is our, you know, what is our housing situation in Richmond? Right. And what we the draft I've seen from Connie goes into that level of detail. It's very good, but not too long. Mm -hmm. But how do we do this? So, you know, we decided that we can't do a flyer for the town center. Well, but the, that's a that's a specific. Josh idea. and I had talked about this. Um, should we have them during the article, Article 14 on Browns Court Housing, get up and say, by the way, we're the Housing Committee. Um, jo Josh's suggestion was that, you know, we should keep Article 14 to the Browns Court question. Mm -hmm. And then during Article 15, which is all other business, that would be an appropriate time for the Housing Committee to stand up and say, F by the way, this housing question you've been talking about, A, we could use more members, and B, here's the facts, and C, we'd love to get a discussion going on this, or whatever. But that's that would that's more or less what we thought would make the most sense. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's what Connie and the group and Mark and there's two Marks there now, right? Well, you, you have Virginia um, and Matt. And Matt. You think of Matt Bruce, so yeah. Matt, okay. Um, but that's the assumption that they're working on is that they would have that. They know they can't make it too dense because people won't read it. But our thought was run it off in brightly colored paper, have it available as you come into the town meeting for people who stay and vote to, for the meeting or people who vote and go home, have the flyer there. And so all day long while people are sitting there in their seats, bored out of their mind, They've got this color. It's going to be wicked exciting. Yeah. They, they, but they've all they've got this flyer that they can be looking at. And I think that's we've got a captive audience right there. It's a chance for information slash education, so to speak, right? Yeah. Subliminal stuff too, if you want. <laughs> well, so how just as a you know, kind of I don't know, how, how will it control the conversation around Flint. the Browns book? Yeah. yeah. It's just gonna be what's mm -hmm. germane to the question. Yeah. And I think in an introduction, you could say this is this specific issue. Article 15 is open ended. You can bring up whatever you want. And mm -hmm. I suspect people will use even... 14 for a springboard into housing mm -hmm. under 15. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think if 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 there it's advertised, it's under Article 15. We there will be discussion on that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can steer them towards that. Um, yeah, I think we're all interested in seeing how that lands on Brown Court. Mm -hmm. Connie has raised her hand since I'm talking for her. We must well let her speak. Yep. Connie. Thanks, Jay. I I just want to make sure that I'm correct. I heard someone say flyers are not allowed in some cases. So I just want to make sure we're doing what you what is okay. Uh, because we're currently working just exactly as Keith said 
on um, the best we can of objective, unbiased facts to share by way of a flyer that would be available at the start of the meeting at nine o'clock throughout the day for anybody to pick up who comes into the building. The question of the flyer, Connie, had to do with the two Australian ballot items um, and whether how much of a presentation or a hand. We can do a presentation, but we can't have a table. We can't have flyers. But that's for the conservation fund and the town center. There's no there should not be any problem with you all having one. Good to know. Thanks so much. I wanted to be completely clear on that. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I for one, I'm glad to have something of a captive audience because the Housing Committee has got a lot of information. They've got a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. And we can put in a link to it in Front Port Forum all day long. Most people won't click it. Yeah. Um, I want people to, this is, a, this is a problem. It's not just a nice to have. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of serious economic and social inequity that I want to do something about. And it's been pointed out to us that both the Planning Commission and the Housing Committee are doing work on it. So it's partly an opportunity to say, here's the problem, here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, hopefully increase interest and input on what is it right. people want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, another update too that I really didn't touch on in my report was, uh, I, I did to a certain extent, is the infill housing that's going on in the town. There's pressure coming. Yeah, and and we need to be careful about that, especially the three reasons that I pointed out in my report and uh, stormwater, which is very important. Uh, we, we we have some stormwater issues in the town. I think everybody's aware of that. Um, and as a result of some of this pressure that is ongoing right now, we're having some issues, which we're mitigating as best we can. But moving forward, I don't think this is going to get any better unless we we get our proverbial you know what together on that. Mm -hmm. So, I think You're absolutely so. right. <laughs> so very quiet tonight you got anything he's david is still in shock over his water bill <laughs> yeah talk about affordable housing oh. mm -hmm. not a, a town of richmond water bill the neighboring town okay you know i almost wonder if we ought to bring up at some point in the housing discussion what's been tried and didn't work and it just is just to give people something to not reactive. I mean, Moving back into caves, that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in what context? <laughs> there are so many layers to the the, the yeah. problem of know, affordable housing. It's know. well, you know, I'd like to also point out we say affordable, it's kind of like you say housing, somebody says affordable. That's not the be on end all. Mm -hmm. Accessible housing for people who are not able to go into two floors. Mm -hmm. Um housing suitable for the elderly. It's not all about affordable. I mean it's work workforce housing. Middle income housing. Yeah, we, we need all of that. The yeah. path to ownership, too, is key. Yeah. And that's something the housing committee is now wrestling with and moving forward, and we're going to get more clarity yeah. on that. And, that. and that's a shout out to Matt on that one. And in so, terms of what has worked, the town of Morris, I always forget, is it Morrisville or Morristown? Because Morrisville is in yeah. Morristown. Okay, there. Yeah. Morrisville, okay. Morrisville put a lot of work into workforce housing. Now, they have the advantage that we don't, they have open land. We don't have open land. Yeah. But that was the that was the way they got the town to buy it. What, to get the town to buy into it was by saying you got to have people to work in your businesses. Right, right. And even that's fraught with oh my god stories of non affordability. Mm huge -hmm. issue in Lake George, and that's where I cut my teeth. So mm -hmm. I mean, workforce housing is huge. And we've also dealt with this in terms of you know uh, maybe back in the day they were low income and now maybe low bottom medium income moderate income. Um, I think of like teacher early career teachers, police officers, town staff. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, a house on my street, Tilden Avenue, that's been knocked down, rebuilt. It's a, now about a half a million dollar house. I got to tell you, it was not that many years ago, oh, half a million. Like, as I mentioned, it, it was like I would have been aghast just five years ago to hear any yeah. house anywhere on our street would be half a million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we One of the things that comes up frequently is paying police officers an additional bump in money if they will live in the town of Richmond. You know, we don't want them living in, in Guam or Royalton or Point Barrow, Alaska. Okay, where are they going to live? You know. That's what I am. I, hopefully it's a good conversation. I think Brown's Court is, you know, circumscribed, contentious in its own way. But it really, the broader discussion is more important. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my office is, is available for comments. Um, we're highly approachable. That's what we do. Thank you as always, Keith, for coming. One more thing. Um, uh, one of your staff got. What's that? One of your staff got a pretty beat up 
tonight in, in the meeting and um, uh, and it was referred to a, a memo that uh, that Tyler wrote relative to this Hillview Heights. Yes. Um, I got to tell you, that memo was extremely helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Reading reading that memo, um, to me, it was very thorough. Um, it was thoughtful. Uh, it was professionally done. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was um, uh, it was very helpful in helping me work through those issues. Good. So um, Good. Just some other, just some feedback. Yeah, fantastic. Good. Okay, well, Keith, thank you. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank Stay drive home. Um, our second to last item of the agenda has to do with Richmond Rescue. Um, no one from Richmond Rescue is here with us tonight, but their quarterly report is in the packet if you want to bring it up. Thank you. The good news is that they're getting the new ambulance soon and can give back the loaner. I will say the link to their statistical report, this is an example of an organization that has well, in my opinion, well-organized service data. When mm -hmm. you say, well, I'm interested in this, and cool. you see it right there. Um, Absolutely. Really good. I, you know, I think it's a it's a model for, you know, what we're looking for police data. There's so many. Like to think about you mm -hmm. know, how they organize their data. I think you're looking really for, was this the one you want? Yeah, that's the link that goes to yeah, the, okay. for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I sometimes just catch myself and go, how the heck did we get such an awesome rescue squad when so many other towns can't get their act together at all? Mm -hmm. oh, no, it's a yeah. huge asset. And I think mission-driven staff and board. Mm -hmm. it, it's taken a long time. It, it, you know, um, uh, it would be worth researching that history um, mm -hmm. relative to um, uh, how to deal with our fire department. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a it's a separate standalone entity. But, you know, they have they are not a town office, but it, it's been a long process. So they're doing lots of car seat fitting, and they're going to be training another person and getting them certified. So people watching at home, if you want to have a car seat professionally fitted to your car for your newborns, infants, toddlers, and bigger kids, Bridgeman Rescue can help. And they have been doing the usual backcountry rescue, and Anything more, you can follow the links here from the article. Anything you want to call out, Josh? No, just that when my kids were little, we went there for car seat fitting and they were great. So, and the training for that is more than you would think. There's a lot that goes into putting okay. a car seat. Yeah. It's four, four, four days. days geez, yeah. It's incredible. And if you haven't put a car seat in, in a while, it's, you can see why. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. Our, our, our all cars have this hooks in. Yeah. Our final item, the um, warrant agenda, before we get to executive sessions, warrants, and purchase orders, is consideration of rescheduling the second select board meeting in February due to the President's Day holiday falling on the third Monday of the month. Um, Josh will be in Guam or Florida, or Florida, right? I'll be Florida on the Monday. He'll be in Florida on the Monday. So if we don't move this, we're meeting without him. Um, but does anybody have any objection? Huh? I got Duncan. You got Duncan. He's fine, but yeah. he might not want to work on President's Day. Um, <laughs> Right. We normally try not to hold meetings that where town staff would be needed on employee holidays. So any questions before someone makes the motion? Any motions in your packet if you want to make it? There. Uh, I move to hold the second February select board meeting on Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, in honor of the President's Day holiday on Monday, February 19th, 2024. Okay, this is David. I'll second. The motion is made by Jeff Ford, seconded by David Sander to move our second select board meeting in February to the 20th in light of the President's Day holiday on the 19th. Please state your name and your vote. This is Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Okay, that brings us to warrants and the real fun part of the meeting. Um, you want your minutes off clock? Yeah, let's. Um, do we have a motion to accept the minutes from our previous meeting on whatever they date that was? Um, 116. 116. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Move that we accept the minutes as written for January 16th meeting. Okay, I'll second it. Spark. We have a motion from Lisa Miller, seconded by David, by, by John uh, Barthill. This guy. <laughs> that guy. Um, to accept the minutes for for January 16th as presented. 
Any additions, corrections, amendations, deletions? Okay, please state your name and your vote. Jeff I. Bard I. David I. Please I. And J I. I believe we had one purchase order tonight. Just the one. Okay, so this is purchase order 4814 in the amount of 49899, scraping just under the margin um, for fire protection. Um, this is the amount of money the town pays the water and sewer department for access to the hydrants throughout the village. Like, yep. yep. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, yep. uh, I can't see the number. Um, it is 4814. I, I move to approve purchase order number 4814 to the town of Richmond for fire 2024 fire protection in the amount of $49,899. It's part of second that. We have a motion to accept purchase order 4814 to the town of Richmond Water and Sewer Department for fire protection for 49899. Motion was made by Jeff Sanders, seconded by Bart Hill. Any discussion? Please state your name and your vote. Um, uh, this is Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Thanks, brother. Are there any questions about the warrants as presented? Um, I, I do I, have a couple. I did notice that there was a charge. Jerry Levesque from the fire department apparently bought a chainsaw. Um, not that there's anything wrong with him buying a chainsaw. I just was like. We have a purchase and procurement policy. Yeah. Yeah, I just. Well, did I don't reimburse him for the chainsaw. Yeah, so I don't it's totally okay. I'm not objecting to it. I just why don't I go through a normal like supplier? Did we pay taxes on it? Does he know a guy? <laughs> well, no, I don't think there's anything. To, I don't think there's anything illicit about the way he he did it. it just, we I I don't normally think of a chainsaw as a fire department thing, but I guess I'm just being stupid because it's late. Definitely need chainsaws. Um, I don't know why he didn't like. Usually they would go through the Granger or somebody and. Get chainsaw. Yeah. He, he didn't get. Did he get? I, I'm trying. I'm trying to it. find it. You know, did he get reimbursed or did he? I think this is just it. No, I think he did go through a vendor. I just was. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to find it because I had it earlier. And um, I think it's a part of the equipment they usually would yeah. carry for rescue. Yeah, I guess for so. Clearing something. They use oh, there we go. Um, rush truck. No, I stand corrected. Anyway, <laughs> so we got a chainsaw, and I do believe he was just. It's a. I wish I could search in this. Um, it's a chainsaw. There's no problem. Move on. Okay. Great Sorry. Well, I sounds like a, Jeff had a couple of questions. Oh, yes. um, oh, right. Sorry. No. Nope. So uh, uh, on the charge point, the charge point bill, it's the FNBO is where it shows up. Um, there are several charges that are for, um, you know, higher than I would expect. Uh, $45. $29, $20, $20, $35. I suspect what those are is the way we've set up our our billing. I, I know this from personal experience because I do plug in. And if we go over four hours, we start charging a dollar an hour. Mm. And the point is, is that, you know, you don't want somebody coming and just part hogging it, like, you know, all night. Oh. However, we want to do that with the Tesla. Because the best time to charge it, if it's a vehicle that you're going to use, is overnight. Mm -hmm. And so, if it's there for overnight, we get charged now. You know, I would assume that we're getting charged. We're charging ourselves a dollar an hour. So it just seems what I think needs to happen is the account needs to change, and then need to talk to ChargePoint about you know this is our mm -hmm. for you know for our vehicle, like which they know which it is. The, you know, not to charge us the extra dollar mm -hmm. yeah. to then give us the money that we should or yeah. give yeah. us the money that yeah. we yeah. pay. Right. Yeah, it's on uh, on the credit card, right? Yeah, it's on the credit card. The yeah. FNBO, I think it's credit card. Okay. Yeah, and there is a what after? Yeah, like you said, there's a fee for like after two or three hours that you get charged for. Oh, there, it doesn't have to be. We can up. set up. We can. Set yeah, up we can set it up for Tesla. Yeah, um, I can look into that. Okay. Any other questions about the warrants and purchase orders? I mean, warrants. There, there was one other thing that was curious to me. I can find it. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, so our fire department gets dispatched through Chelburne. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Wait, they what? just do dispatching. 
It's just that's who we contracted with. Oh, that's all right. Okay. Um, well, regional dispatch was an idea that <laughs> whose time the apparently is still working. not yet come. The bar is still working on it. It'll, it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that, that's all. <laughs> yeah, they've done the dispatch. Okay. Do, do we have a motion to accept? So moved. Is Bart, I will second that. Motion from Jeff Ford, seconded by Bart Hill to accept the warrants. Please state your name and your vote. Is Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Okay. Our um, next item is um, any items for our next agenda? Update on Heinsberg uh, police discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any final prep for town meeting day? Oh, yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, last year, you know, town meeting is always on a Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. And we have money. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Right. Last year, we we moved our select board meeting that was going to be on the Monday because it would have conflicted with the night before town meeting. Yeah. Um, I don't see any reason to do that this time. We have so the we have two more select board meetings between now and town meeting is what I'm trying to say. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the second one's the night before. The second one is the night before. So in terms of prep, but I'm just saying we we do have to. We'll also have the informational meeting the Monday before right. the week before. So that's right. that's also sort of a dry run through. And so I mean, I'll usually get some feedback on the budget presentation. There'll probably be a presentation on the um, yeah. town center again. So that's also a good time for some more feedback and final tweaks before the big show on the 5th of March. Right. So it's 26th and yes. the, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm meeting on the 4th. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. So, um, Lisa. I think I have a question. Let me think it through. Uh, <laughs> it's late. I'll tell you what. Okay. I haven't sat through this side of the town meeting before. So I have a, a lot of, you know, I have no knowledge really of, what went on in the you get to sit up on stage and, and people take pictures of you. I know. You'll be able to lose. Um, wear a raincoat for the tomatoes. <laughs> but there has been discussion um, with various town boards and so forth about things that I'm, I don't know what was said and I don't know what answers were given. Maybe I should just stay away from those, but I'd really kind of like to know too because. Uh, there may be good information I'm you know, not not hearing. So um do we plan to bring any of that stuff up before town meeting or a month or so? I think you have stumbled across another example of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There you go. <laughs> Brownian yeah. motions related. You are not sure who what was said to whom when. Right. <laughs> well, I know things were said when and by whom and to whom, but I don't know what was said. So <laughs> I guess what I'd just say yeah. when, yeah. when you when you start to look at town meeting, I mean, a lot of the conversation is really about the specific articles, right? So you're probably not going to get an Andrews Community Forest trail building question unless it goes into the other agenda item or it's somehow related to the budget. Uh, but at least that's been my experience. We'll walk through the budget. There'll be probably some departmental questions and specific things about the budget. Mm -hmm. um, the social services, we'll have all those on the website easily accessible. We could print them out if you guys want a couple of handouts. We can read through those. Um, we'll talk about brands court. Mm -hmm. But and I think really, I mean, you guys can provide feedback. If there's a question that we don't know the answer to, it's okay to say, we're not really sure. There's a committee that's working on some of those details. We'll continue to look into that. Or we'll get back to you. Yeah. Do we have a verdict on whether we can do one paper ballot for all the? Uh, you know, I got to follow up with Clint because he was looking into sort of a process. He was calling moderators in other towns that have done this before or usually do it to find out what their best practices are. And I've been on an email chain with him and Linda, and I think you're on that same email chain. So no, I, I haven't. Just wasn't sure. No, there, I haven't seen a, a closed loop back. I'll, I'll reach out to him this week to find out what his process is. You know, so yeah. instead of having, because invariably it'll happen, it's a paper ballot for oh, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A paper ballot takes half an hour yeah. just to go through the process. Of it. But otherwise, on the other hand, it, no one wants to be the one who stands up and says, I vote against money for the price, right prices. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's fair to have a, a paper mm -hmm. ballot, but um, I'm, what I'm hoping for, and I, what I understand Clint's looking into, is can we have the discussion on all of them and then, then people yeah. take... You know, check yes, oh, no, yes, so no, on each yeah. one. Yeah. And Bard, you were going to talk to MMCTV about 
a short video explaining why we're doing it this way. Yeah, we talked about that and we were talking about a script, Josh and yeah. I, and that's... I mean, we have the FAQ. There you go. Which we could, I mean, I could ask you the question, you could yeah. respond if we yeah. wanted to do something simple like that. I think it's so, using the same document. So yeah. yeah, we could schedule that. And then we could also post it and put a link to it in some form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think those are the ways to do it. We still have a few weeks, so maybe sometime next week. When do you head out? Um, I won't be physically here next week, but Duncan might be able to sit in if all we're doing is a question and answer yeah, thing. Yeah, that could be fine. I could also do it. Or in Gallic, Zoom. you could sit there and ask you. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I think Ruth, who's on the call tonight, might be. I'm not sure who. I don't know. But I think it was Ruth was asking me, "Hey, when do you want to do that? Let me know. We'll schedule it. So um, we'll follow up." All right. Okay. So that brings us to our. And you know how to find Josh if anything else to put on the agenda. Um, we have two separate executive sessions on very different topics. So we have to move them independently of each other. Our first has to do with um, a proposed settlement for appeal of property valuation, which there's a pair of motions in the agenda and the memo if you'd like to make them. I move to find the premature public knowledge about discussion of a proposed settlement relating to appeal of property valuation would cause a town or person suffer a substantial disagreement. This is David, I'll second. Okay. Any discussion of that motion? Okay, we have a motion made by Jeff Forward, forward second by David Sander, to move to find a premature public knowledge about discussion of, of a proposed settlement related to appeal of property valuation would cause the town or person to suffer a substantial disadvantage. Please state your name and your vote. It's Jeff I. Bard I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Maybe. I move that we enter into an executive session to discuss a proposed settlement related to an appeal of property valuation under the provisions of 1 VSA 313A1 and to invite the town manager, Josh Arneson, into the executive session. This is David. I'll second. Yeah, we have a motion from Jeff Ford, seconded by David Sander, to move that we enter into an executive session to discuss a proposed settlement related to appeal of property valuation. Under the provisions of 1 VSA 313A1 and to invite the town manager, Josh Arneson, into the executive session. Please state your name and your vote. Scott I. Bart I. Believe it I. Lisa I. And Jay I. But um, I've logged out of the meeting and I'm going to leave my computer here anyway. Yeah, I'm going to leave this here and leave my computer here too. So I don't know if there's any reason to do it. Yeah. Okay. See what I did with my new saws off? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So MMC TV has dropped off. I don't know. It's a boat. Okay. So we don't need to. Like a nope. Second. And you did both okay. motions to get in. I wasn't paying attention. You did both motions to get into executive session, right? I believe it was Jeff's motion. Sorry. Executive. And I don't know why. I'm fading. Okay. We got <laughs> missed that. We got one motion for this. Just trying to make the next motion. I yes. I find that uh, premature public knowledge about negotiations with the police union would cause the sound. Or union to suffer a or a person or a person down or a person okay or a person to suffer a substantial disadvantage. Is Bard on second that? Okay, and we have a motion from Jeff Ford, seconded by Bard Hill, to move to find the premature public knowledge about negotiations with the police union would cause a town or person to suffer a substantial disadvantage. I see what you're saying. Or union. I just was sticking to this strict letter of the motion, but yes, union actually would have made more sense. Please state your name and your vote. Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa. And Jay I. I move that we enter into executive session and discuss negotiations with the police union on the provisions of 1 BSA 313A1 and to invite town manager Josh Arneson into the executive session. Isn't David a second? Okay. We have a motion to move into executive session and invite Josh Arneson in with us. Motion was made by Jeff Ford, seconded by David Sander. Please state your name and your vote. Uh, Jeff I. Bart I. David I. Lisa I. And Jay I. Okay. We are back. Would anybody like to make a motion to adjourn? Ms. Bard, I will second the motion. We have a motion seconded by Bard Hill to adjourn. Discussion. Please state your name and your vote. David I. Bard I. And Jay I. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bard, how's your hook? Oh, <laughs>